Welcome to Kurt Vonnegut, the podcast dedicated to the life and works and ongoing things of Kurt Vonnegut, because he's the greatest author of all time. My name is Alex Schmidt, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Michael Swaim. Woo! Yeah! Woo! Woo. Ongoing things of Vonnegut. Oh, they're assemble. ongoing. <laughs> <laughs> they can't get in the studio. The door shuts. Oh, that's true. We're in taping yeah. mode. All of the ongoing Vonnegut things are very yeah. polite. <laughs> And uh, today we're talking about Slapstick. Mm -hmm. It is a novel from 1976 mm -hmm. by Kurt. It's his first novel after Breakfast of Champions, which we uh, yes. super, super love. And I think we can get straight into it with a segment called Plot Time. Plot, lot, lots of plot in the plot time. The thing you shot blew up, I guess. Were those pew pews lasers or just musical pews? I think I imagine like someone just <laughs> doing laser fingers with their hands, oh, being very the, happy. Sure, like a like, happy pew, prospector pew, pew, with pew. lasers yeah. in the future when they discover uridium <laughs> or yeah. something. Yeah. I have a space western script for <laughs> you that pew, I'd pew, like pew. us to read this episode. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> that is now the episode. Nah. Nah. This, uh, Let's do slapstick instead. <laughs> yeah. This book, it kind of does a back and forth plot. It's written far into the future after sort of America has fallen apart and then it looks back through the life of the main character. But even before that, we should probably do the the little itty bitty <laughs> intro stuff that we always the do. The little tiny bitty. It is a quick read. Yeah. I would say that first for people if you if you didn't read this one. It's uh one of his most like coherent and short Whereas every time we tried to do like, God bless you, Mr. Rosewater, we're like, okay, now for 20 minutes, this is what the character's thinking about the future, which is, right. the plot is pretty concrete. I enjoyed that very much. Yeah. And probably less speeches than a lot of the books have yeah. or less long ruminations. It's sort of, he's trying to just express it through yeah, what's going Yeah. And to on. link it to our last episode where we talked about in Breakfast of Champions, he basically said explicitly, I'm sorry, in an interview that came out with Playboy during the Breakfast of Champions period. Yeah. that we covered as part of Wampeter's Foam on Grand Flunes. He said, I think this is like a reset point for me, yeah. and you're going to see my books feel different. And I just think that's so interesting to keep in mind the whole time, because I want to get into it more later, but this does feel like a spiritual twin to Sirens of Titan to me. Almost oh, like he is resetting his career and doing it again. And it does feel tonally different. Exactly like he said, like his predictions are spot on. He's like, I think I'm going to explore the same themes in like a more clinical, well-assembled way that's less like wild and heart driven. And he totally does. That's exactly like a perfect description of the book that he was going to write in the future. Yeah. Which is amazing. I could never accurately predict what a show I'm going to make in three years might be like. That's crazy. Yeah, he really does. And even in Breakfast of Champions itself, he says, I'm going to free my characters and uh, no longer repeat them all the time. And he pretty yeah. much does. Sorry, Norman to an extent. <laughs> Right, <laughs> You're trapped forever. <laughs> I'll take his son. Which he does. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, you're right. It is a shift in terms of how he's approaching this. Yeah. I do think he also, he's trying, he's ruminating throughout this book about a long ago death, which I think makes it similar to... Breakfast of Champions, and also similar in some ways to Slaughterhouse Five, where it's like, oh, this is a huge event in my life mm -hmm. that I've waited a decade or two to finally tackle. And I don't think he does it nearly as successfully this time. Oh, yeah. meaning the death of his sister, you think? Yeah, where, okay. where Breakfast of Champions was a lot about the suicide of his mother, yes. and Slaughterhouse is trying to finally do the Dresden book, the war right. book. You know, this is, oh, I'm finally going to do my sister's death. And uh -huh. I, I think he really swings and misses as far as making a great book out of it. Interesting. Yeah. I disagree. Let's get into Let's the plot. Let's get into the plot. But before the plot, <laughs> <laughs> there's all kinds of uh, prologue dedications and quotes, as he loves to do. Yeah. My copy has, well, the dedication is to the memory of Arthur Stanley Jefferson and Norville Hardy, two angels of my time. Uh, they're better known as Laurel and Hardy, and mine has a Hirschfeld drawing of the two of them uh, being real, oh, being real goofs. That's cool. Mine doesn't; it just has the words. But yeah, yeah, Laurel and Hardy, I'm sure you know of. And if you've never seen a Laurel and Hardy short, they really hold up because it's just slapstick. Yeah, <laughs> and things like a very clever way of something spinning <clears throat> around and falling and hitting someone in the head, and is always funny. Like, there's no context required. Yeah, it's and Laurel and Hardy were great at it. Much better than the Three Stooges, in my opinion. They stand the test of time a lot more. I'd buy it. I've only seen a little of them, but it's yeah, it's really good. And it's like the Stooges or 
to kind of an extent the Marx Brothers, where it's still pretty sharp. Like it, it just moves. And I think yeah. the Marx Brothers are as good as anything any movie that comes out these days. But that's yeah. they're like one of my primary inspirations. Just oh, because good. they're great. Well, Laurel and Hardy were able to be timeless with slapstick, but. The Marx Brothers used words, so <laughs> that's right. the thing in comedy that almost always becomes dated. Like 15 years later, you watch something, you're like, well, this doesn't hold up at all, because all the words they sang are dated jokes or offensive now. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And Marx Brothers movies are still funny. You can drop someone who doesn't know anything about anything in front of a Marx Brothers movie, and they'll laugh out loud several times during the movie. Uh, let's move on. They're astounding. Absolutely. I They're love great. the Marx Brothers. Agreed. They're fantastic. Groucho's uh, my boy. After the dedication to Laurel and Hardy, there's one line, call me but love and I'll be new baptized. Romeo from Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. So Shakespeare. Yeah. And also introducing the theme of love. Is love real? What is it? If it's what is love right. is a big theme <laughs> of this book. And baby don't hurt me is also a big theme baby of this book. Me, but... No more. No uh, more is a theme. It is the theme. apocalypse. Um, but that anyway. Line, is it not a lot? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think, though, that, yeah, so the idea here, obviously, that Romeo feels that love is something so real that it can change his very nature. He can become new through love, or yeah. he can embody love, call me love, make love my name, and I'll become love incarnate. And then immediately, like in the prologue, he several times says, I don't know if love is real. I can't differentiate between the love I have for dogs and the love I have for humans. I don't understand when all these fictional narratives talk about true love, what they're describing, because I've never felt it. <laughs> and yeah. So I think one of the main themes of the book is, is love real? What is love? We talk about it all the time. Do we agree about what it is even? <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. Yeah, and it also, in the prologue, because also it, once he does those two dedication on the line, it goes straight into a long prologue from Kurt's perspective directly. And another thing he ruminates on is the idea of if you go chasing after love, if you pursue it for its own ends, that can be bad, that can be destructive, that can lead you the wrong way. And I think he is acknowledging more through that Romeo line that people will do that anyway. They're just going to chase after it, even if they know it's a bad idea, or even if... Kurt says so. You know, it's well, maybe. It's one of the confusing things for me, and I think this is meat leaking out. But yeah, Wilbur and Eliza agree that I love you is a stupid thing to say because they say it's like putting a gun to your head. The only proper response is I love you too. So it's just a demand for validation, blah, 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 like that jaded view of what the interaction of love can be. But then, of course, there's a very important point where Wilbur screams, I love you, Eliza, and she's like, shut up. And he's like, but I mean it, though. Like, I really feel it right now. I know, blah, blah, blah. So I just really have, still as a question mark, I wonder, does Vonnegut believe love exists? <laughs> Is it good or bad? Is it a fabrication? And yeah. we know that he believes that fabrications can be helpful even though they're fabrications sometimes. So right. is love a FOMA or a real thing or a fake thing that's not helpful? I can't, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's hard a to really tell. interesting question that the book puts forth several times. When he's also, and when he's writing this, he's personally progressed to a little bit of a different point than he was in previously in his life. He's, he's been divorced for a few years now. Mm. He's in a new relationship with the lady who's going to be his second wife, Jill Kremitz. He's also living in Manhattan, which we saw in a couple previous books, too. It makes him feel very kind of detached and distant from things because now his adult children are in all sorts of different cities yeah. and his older relatives are dying off. He talks in the intro of this about his uncle Alex Vonnegut dying, and that was an important person in his life. So I could see him kind of questioning love or losing track of it a little more at this specific time in his life more than he has previously. It'd be tough to be courting a woman or at the beginning stages of a relationship and she's like, what are you working on? Book about how love is fake <laughs> bullshit. Except you, darling, of course. Also, I, a lot of interviews later in life, he seems to, or he says like, all Manhattanites are my brothers and sisters or whatever. So it's interesting. Yeah. I'm sure he was... It was probably alienating at first, but it seems like by the end of his life, he had he had been able to believe the FOMA that all New Yorkers were connected to him in some way. Yeah, and got yeah. some solace from that. Well, and especially, I feel like a book like Timequake really argues that it's his home and nerve center. And yeah, because he has the whole all of his people there all at once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Nemo but at the, are but at this highly stage, romanticized. But at this stage, <laughs> I think he makes it an island of death because he doesn't feel totally positive about it. Yeah, New York, yeah. the island of death. Yeah, let's get back to stuff that happened. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, um, the rest of the prologue gets a lot of... He introduces Hi-Ho, which is the sort of refrain of this book. Uh, later on, he'll call it... A sort of a senile outburst, I think it is. So the author is... Senile a, hiccup. So right. Yeah. It's a journal-style book, so the main character is writing this all down in their journal, and you're reading it after their death. So he just says several times, I can't not write hi-ho, I'm sorry. And then he says, like, I swear I'm going to try to stop writing hi-ho. Hi-ho! And yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> um, but it's like a tick he has, because he's 101 years old at the time he's writing this. Yeah. And uh, well, crazy. The, <laughs> so the, the main character is, yeah. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. that's Who what I mean. Who is a clear Vonnegut stand-up. Well, he says know. in the prologue, this is the closest he'll ever come to writing an autobiography. Of course, yeah. he hadn't written Palm Sunday yet, which is literally an autobiography. Yeah, it's really funny to me that... <laughs> Five years later, which is zero time and novelist time, he writes an actual autobiographical mm -hmm. piece, which we're going to do a live episode with. More on that later. Yeah. But yeah, so he immediately when I read that, since we're also prepping Palm Sunday, I was like, no, no, yeah. you're going to do more well, of I, one. Uh... You're about to. And he explains the Laurel and Hardy connection. Uh, and the connection to his sister, who died of cancer very young, and the idea that, well, as she was dying, she just described life once as vaudeville, slapstick, like just ridiculously comically grotesque things bouncing off of each other. And he says, so that's why this book's dedicated to Laurel and Hardy. It's why it's called Slapstick, and that's what it's about. <laughs> yeah, and he, I think he says that their movies are perfect because those guys are trying to make the best of their situation in good faith all of the time. And so just watching them always put that effort in is the hook. That's what brings you in. And he says it's more important than love. He says two multiple things. Decency is more important than love. And that bargaining in good faith with destiny is more important than love. Yeah. So he's like, Laurel and Hardy movies never had a love story. That's why they're the perfect mascots for this book. All they were worried about is, oh, the task presented to us is this impossible task of getting a piano up this giant flight of stairs. Well, like, we better roll up our sleeves and try to get the giant piano up the flight of stairs, yeah. even though this is always goes badly every time we've ever done anything like this. <laughs> um, and he thinks that's important to be able to, like, have faith that it's worth trying to go on in life. Yeah. <laughs> and, and especially the let's show each other common decency rather than love each other idea seems like it's really coming from him being someone who's gone through a heartbreaking divorce. Yes. Uh, that, and which I have not, so it probably didn't speak to me as and much. And not because... demand love of each other, just demand like politeness. <laughs> yeah, because I'm guessing in hindsight he thinks we should have just not fought as much either way, you know, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Really interestingly, I just want to point out totally as an aside, this is just insane. He says in the prologue about his sister's death, and hers would have been an unremarkable death statistically if it were not for one detail, which was this. Her healthy husband, James Carmalt Adams, the editor of a trade journal for purchasing agents, which he put together in a cubicle on Wall Street, died two mornings before on the broker's special, the only train in American railroading history to hurl itself off of an open drawbridge. Think of that. This really happened. And it's like insane. <laughs> he, even he's aware. Like, what are the odds? And yeah. like in the ultimate, it's such a sad, brutal thing that would happen in a Kurt Vonnegut novel. Through random happenstance, right. his sister found out her <clears throat> husband died horribly the day before she died of cancer. So they had tried to, she had thought their children would be well taken care of and shit. And the day before she dies of cancer, they're like, no, your husband also died. No one knows what's going to happen. Anyway, die yeah. now. And he's like, life is crazy. <laughs> like that's comedic in its impossibility. Why did that happen? It's yeah. nuts. Yeah. And the, uh, yeah. And the her being his sister, Alice, who he said before is, I, I think the death he's trying to process with this. And they don't even tell her in the hospital that her husband died because they're like, that's too out. hard on her. Yeah. But then somebody brings her a paper with the train crash in it. And there's a list of the dead. And, and there's a list like, of the dead. And she happens oh, to read it. Well, yeah. then that happened. <laughs> and then he says, even still, since Alice had never received any religious instruction, she never thought of her awful luck as being anything but accidents in a very busy place. Good for her. And I think that's also one of the main themes of the book. Yeah, I think so yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, and then he uh, talks a little bit about how when he lost Alice, he lost the per the one person who he specifically wrote for. If you've ever read any of Kurt's direct advice about writing, one of his tips is to write for one person and not 
try to open your window and make love to the whole world because then you'll get frostbite or pneumonia, I think it is. Your uh, dick falls off. Right. <laughs> and so he lost his person that he wrote for and he felt an absence and a, a hole and uh, he's kind of trying to process it in this book. But uh, And her death happened in 1958, so this is 18 years later and he's wow. finally yeah. taking it on in a novel. And then he briefly talks about how much he hates writing and how every writer hates writing more than anything. <laughs> and there's great quotes from famous writers who said, like, I never knew a blacksmith who was in love with his anvil, or the definition of a writer is someone who hates writing more than anything else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Oh, and, and then also some little anecdotes about his brother, Bernard, who does love his anvil uh, and because uh, he's an atmospheric scientist and really likes that. And if you, if you want to know more about him, there's an amazing book called The Brothers Vonnegut by Ginger Strand that gets into their back and forth. Yeah. Uh, but he, he comes up a lot in the intro as well, and they have some nice jokes back and forth. Nice. Yeah. Those are all the musings, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. we can get into the text of the book. Chapter and it's also, one. in mine, it's like a 20-page prologue. Like, it's, it's a pretty meaty piece of his life and his thoughts. Interestingly structured in the sense that, so first of all, it's a journal, and then at the end, it stops in media res, and then the epilogue is some narrator you never know who it is, Yeah, just saying, it's almost like the end of Cloverfield or something, then the person writing the journal died. Here's a, here's what happened after that. Right. In a very like a drier tone than the rest of the book has been. They don't yeah. say hi ho. They don't have any characteristics. They're like an <laughs> omniscient narrator just telling you what happened. And yet the epilogue is also very long and gives you crucial information. It's just crazy to me. I crunched the numbers page wise, and it's like. A full 21% of this book, Really, some people would skip. Because I know people who don't think to read prologues and epilogues. Oh, sure. And yeah. I'm just like, it would ruin the book if you didn't know the epilogue <laughs> had a bunch of plot information in it. Like, it's not just a wrap-up. It explains yeah. future events that happen, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> so read the whole... It's so crucial. It's short, guys. Read it from cover to cover. This yeah, one, it's, for it's sure. a spy. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, but yeah, chapter one opens with... The main character saying, this is a journal. To whom it may concern. Yeah, the, the prologue ends with a joke where uh, Kurt says that the way his I, oh, yeah. his uncle w uh, his uncle had a joke about how agnostics would address their evening prayers toward to whom it may concern, which is, you know, ha 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 ha, they don't know which God. And so then the, <laughs> the main part of the book immediately opens with to whom it may concern and yeah. we're into it. And it's, the journal is written by Dr. Wilbur Daffodil Eleven Swain. Hey. Wait, what? Swain. One of my ears is burning. <laughs> <laughs> Swain, by far the most common mispronunciation of my name. Yeah, so it's this, amazing. Therefore, this is my favorite book, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's how that works. Yeah. And this is, as far as I know, the only Vonnegut book with any Swains in it. So this yeah. is the one. Is yeah. It? So uh, he's our... Kind of our uh, Vonnegut stand-in, and as Michael said, everything but the epilogue and prologue is from his perspective. Sure. Oh, fun and fact, just because I know this because of research into my name, Swain is German for a young lover. Really? Yeah, which does. Oh. So, okay. as he always with the Vonnegut purpose. names, he picked the name on purpose. It, yeah, for yeah, sure. He loves that. Oh, and man. I still, this has been on the tip of my tongue for five years now. There is a word, and I keep thinking it's malapropism, but it's not, for giving a character a name that is what they are, like an Oliver Twist, Mr. Bumble, or whatever, and he's oh, bumbling. Yeah. There's a name for what that is. It's not synecdoche or apostrophe, but it's something. I forget. Someone fucking tell me. It's been killing me for literally like a half a decade. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. There but is Vonnegut a word. loves him. Don't know what it is. Yeah. So I think yeah. Swain is one. Seems like it would be. He's in love with his sister, guys. I'm just going to throw it out there. <laughs> yeah. And he also, in the prologue, and he expands on this a lot in Palm Sunday, but he talks about how his family, all German people, the Vonnegut family, the Lieber family, all German roots. But then when the two world wars came along, they stopped learning their German heritage. So he yes. like learned some of it and would know enough of it to do that name thing. He's got to yeah. know. Yeah. That yeah. That's the origin. Yeah. And so this is uh, the journal of Dr. Wilbur Daffodil Levin Swain. He's the former and final president of the United States, and he's living in Manhattan, which has become the island of death. It's known as the home of the Green Death. It's sort of an I am legend Manhattan with only a few people and everything's ruined. It's fucking awesome. Like, yeah. Sirens of Titan didn't even have the apocalypse. And as far as I'm aware, 
other than <coughs> several books, Time Quake also does, that like have the apocalypse very near the end. This is yeah. his only fully post-apocalyptic book, and it's very post-apocalyptic, and I love it. All the sci-fi That's ideas true. are awesome. Yeah, Cat's Cradle kind of holds it till the end. Till the very end. Yeah. But like all throughout this book, you're getting fluctuating gravity and like all the stuff you want. Abandoned skyscrapers being used in ways that they weren't intended to be used for. Yeah. Yeah. People living yeah. in weird, like quasi societies. It's cool. Yeah. The king of Michigan is a guy. <laughs> there's a I think there's a Duke of Oklahoma. Oh, there's several war yeah. lo- post apocalypse like, warlords yeah. in the book. <laughs> it's great. So yeah, he lives in the Empire State Building. Yeah. And all the honorifics are fucking awesome. His his title is the King of Candlesticks. Yeah, <laughs> which they explain later is that he was offered a, a whole array of gifts, just took a candlestick to be nice and take something, and then a rumor went around that he loves candlesticks, and so everybody brings him candlesticks all yeah. the time, which is really, which is a funny, realistic thing that will happen with like, yeah. oh, your parents think you love a thing because you did it once. You know? Yeah. So he lives on the first floor of the Empire State Building in the post-apocalyptic plague-ridden Manhattan with his 16-year-old granddaughter... And her lover, and their names are Melody Oriel II von Peterswald <laughs> and Isidore Raspberry 19 Cohen. <laughs> yeah. The names are awesome in this book. Because <laughs> also the book will explain more and more as it goes on that while he was president, Wilbur instituted a system where everyone is given a new middle name that's a noun and then a number one through 20. And right. so everyone has an artificial family based on this middle name. But that means all the characters you meet, especially later in the have book, have insane names. goofy, ridiculous middle names. And yeah. Even for Vonnegut, the names are crazy. Yeah. They're great. Their nearest neighbor <clears throat> is the slave owner. Yeah. Vera Chipmunk 5 Zappa, who I believe is one of the Frank Zappa's children, right? <laughs> that was after. my immediate thought. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's he could have easily. You got <laughs> Ahmed and Moon Unit. Why not Vera Chipmunk 5? It felt very natural. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, amazed by that. So, chapter one is he's really like giving you the lay of the land. He doesn't actually explain the middle name thing, but right. obviously, you notice everyone's middle name is this ridiculous hyphenated <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> He talks about basically that's the whole neighborhood, him, his granddaughter, her boyfriend, and this woman, Vera, and all of her slaves. Yeah, her very happy <laughs> slaves. It's like they love the system Honestly, and they love the community. But, all right, yeah. I guess. <laughs> it's what's in the book. Yeah. So. And it's like a big plantation farm. They live uh, by bartering with Vera. She's their only neighbor. Yeah. People rarely come to the island of death because it's such a virulent center of disease. So the few survivors who dot the globe don't really visit it. Yeah, there's the Green Death and also the Albanian flu have killed most of the people in the world. Uh, Yeah, Uh, so the apocalypse this time was, well, many, many things, which is cool, I think. It's a combination. We'll find out that China does a bunch of things, but among other things, it's heavily implied, starts to fuck with the gravity on Earth, which causes a bunch of death. Then simultaneously, there are not one, but two pandemics. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, the whole world just kind of gives up. They're like, oh, well, this isn't going to work out. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And also, China manipulating the world's gravity means that gravity is like weather now. So sometimes it will be very heavy, and sometimes it will be very light, and it just kind of shifts around. And they also establish that that's how people People built stuff like the pyramids and the Great Wall and and great wonders of the world because just gravity was light on those days and they were able to chuck the bricks. In biblical times, gravity fluctuated, then it stabilized, yeah. and now the Chinese have discovered that fact and discovered how to manipulate it and have reverted it back to like fluctuating, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how they benefit from that. We never find out what they're thinking or why they wanted to do that, but... Yeah, it's never clear. <laughs> yeah. So the gravity is very light today. As a result, I have an erection. <laughs> Yeah, also, right. All this the This hundred year old man often has a boner. <laughs> Keep that in mind. That's important. Yeah. There's also a world where China has surpassed all the other countries in the world by a lot. And they've partly done it by miniaturizing themselves and becoming smaller. So they need less food individually. And then they've also figured out some way to materialize in other places, which lets them just show up in America when they want to and has also let them go to Mars whenever they want to. They can just arrive there. And probably further, that's just all that they let us know that they're doing or whatever. Right. They yeah. all, And it's also revealed that the source of all these discoveries <laughs> was that they discovered how to manage ESP, basically. They yeah. were able to start telepathically linking groups of people and 
apparently. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So, like, if you link 10 people, you get 100 times brain power, right? right? So then they immediately had basically a singularity where now Chinese people are all psychically linked. They immediately become a massive mind that knows everything, and they invent everything, and they can do anything. Yeah. And they're all really tiny. <laughs> <laughs> right. So they're a super country of tiny people that becomes very mysterious to the rest of the world. Psychic teleporting tiny people, them. yeah. Yeah. Okay, and, and then, uh, yeah, he's ba- he's laying a lot of because he's basically writing it as if, thankfully, you don't know anything, right? Which so he's know. describing how the world works, <laughs> and he also lays out his family. It's he was born Wilbur Rockefeller Swain, and he had a fraternal twin named Eliza Mellon Swain. They were both born with six fingers, six toes, four nipples, and very very hideous looks. And their two parents were also very, very wealthy people. Uh, his father, Caleb Mellon Swain, and Letitia Vanderbilt Swain, uh, yeah, formerly a Rockefeller. So it's all it's all like the wealth of America is their he family. He loves, yeah. So basically, the supporting cast of God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater. Yeah, it's a, uh, a bunch gave of birth to these people. <laughs> Rosewater, Rumford type folks. Yeah. Rockefellers, Vanderbilts. He has an obsession with, as he should. Yeah. The fact that uh, there's this 1% of people that have all the money for some reason. Yeah, yeah. And it stays in the family, which is bizarre. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's still odd <laughs> to me that you can be born having $500 million. It just seems odd. Yeah. It's weird. It's like, what a weird to... way to have, live your life. But yeah, uh, I want to shout out a poem. He has a poem in the first chapter and a poem in the last chapter, and I think they're both pretty damn beautiful. Yeah. His poem in the opening chapter is about his middle name, which was randomly assigned, which is Daffodil Eleven. And he says the fact that he's a daffodil inspired him to write this poem about being a daffodil and about life itself, of course. I was those seeds. I am this meat. This meat hates pain. This meat must eat. This meat must sleep. This meat must dream. This meat must laugh. This meat must scream. But when, as meat, it's had its fill, please plant it as a daffodil. (laughs) (laughs) And then he says, and who will read this journal? God knows. So you also explicitly know that this book is for no one. It's basically his private journal that he doesn't expect anyone to read ultimately. And even Kurt only sort of knows, because in the epilogue, an unnamed yeah. character... And his grandchildren can't read explicitly. Right. Also, in yeah, fact, no one else in Manhattan away. can read that he knows of. Yeah. yeah. He also says, Melody and Isidore and all people of, who were born during the apocalypse, which this is interesting to me because it's very different than other post-apocalypse movies and books. They have no curiosity about the human past. They don't care how the apocalypse happened. They don't want to <laughs> fix it. It would be like if in The Walking Dead they were like, I guess it's always been this way with zombies. Let's just move forward. (laughs) Uh, Which is interesting. It's like, as far as they are concerned, the most glorious accomplishment of the people who inhabited the island of Manhattan so teemingly was to die so that they could have it all to themselves. They're just pleased that they have a whole island. (laughs) It's very chilled out. Uh, He asked them to name the most three important human beings in the history of Earth. And they say, you, their grandfather... (laughs) Probably Jesus and probably Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so he's they, like, eh, not bad. And he's like, that's a good guess. Yeah. <laughs> At least that gives you a very clear tone of the state of technology, culture. This is the level we're at. Pretty yeah. thoroughly post-apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. It's like uh, almost whimsically falling apart, I'd say, a little bit. Like, yeah. It's, it's dark, but it's, you know, light yeah. in its way. And the last thing in the chapter is that he says that when he asks them questions about the past or to try and think, they seem very unhappy when he stops asking them questions. They're usually as happy as Schmitty the Clams. And uh, <laughs> and then the very last line of chapter one is, they hope to become slaves of Vera Chipmunk someday. Right. <laughs> That's their ambition it's in like life. like their goal, yeah. To work on the farm, because all the slaves seem really happy. We'll get to Vana what? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll dig into it. Um, Although that's basically it. It's a short one. I had a little bit more. You had a little more. Yeah. Great. The only thing that really shot out to me is that he repeatedly describes the slaves as very pleased that they're slaves. And I just don't know if you should be saying that in any context. Yeah, I was actually... Because it's, it's sci-fi. Strange. And one very specific case. Like, it's not like he's saying 
slavery across a country was working. It was just like one person. He also doesn't was ever say well. that the slaves are organized by skin color, or culture, or anything. Right. I yeah. think is it. But then I wonder why use the word slaves? It sounds like they're just the staff of people who work together on this farm. But it's, they unquestioningly yeah. say, no, she is the master and they are her slaves. Yeah. So you never get the details. But something weird is going on if you use the word slaves, I think. Right, it's not like, great. Yeah, it, why yeah. do they consider themselves slaves instead of workers? When, and her family feels very background to me, too. Like, it's not crucial to any of them. Well, the, yeah, you never know yeah, all yeah. the details about this, but... That's interesting. Anyway, yeah. you have more. Later, um, chapter two. Yeah, <laughs> from there he, he lays out sort of his life from birth to now. He talks about how when he and Eliza were born... As twins, the doctors assumed they were probably going to be mentally deficient in some way. For the record, this is all pre-apocalypse, so nor right, right, right. imagine the normal world. <laughs> yeah, now it's it's normal times. And uh, the parents decide that they're going to take the kids up to the old family estate in Vermont. Before the family was super wealthy, they were ordinary Vermont apple farmers. And then one ancestor named Elihu Roosevelt Swain built the fortune. So there's a mansion up there and they're going to sort of raise the children in seclusion there and try to turn them into whatever they can turn them into. They feel like it's like, oh, these, these children will never be fully functioning adults. Let's just leave them there. Yeah. So they're like, the, yeah, the inbred monster children yeah. that the rich family spends all the money in the world to make them not feel guilty, but like discards. Yeah. And uh, also the doctors tell them that Wilbur and Eliza will probably die very young. It seems like they're not put together properly right. physically. So the parents intentionally don't invest much emotion in them. Yeah. But then they just brace. keep living. And then of course they, yeah. he lives to 101 clearly. <laughs> he does tell you immediately up front. And I had a dizygotic twin named Eliza. She will be killed at the age of 50 in an avalanche on the outskirts of the Chinese colony on the planet Mars. Right. And, uh, he... and it's just another great Vonnegut, like, this will happen. <clears throat> now, see how I get there, because it seems impossible. <laughs> yeah. And we, we laid a lot out a lot of the world building up front so that what we're talking about makes sense. But he hasn't told you any of that when he just suddenly tells you, by the way, my twin sister dies on the Chinese. Like, you don't you understand any of that. He really gets off on that later. trick in this one. Yeah. Like, I love that later... Later when the Chinese official Fu Manchu, okay, I guess I have more than just the slaves yeah. thing, yeah. is reading their notes. He's like, did you find anything interesting? And he's like, yes, a ticket to Mars for a large Caucasian lady in Peru. And I love that out of context, <laughs> you're like, well, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> but if you've read to that point in the book, you're like... I know what he's saying. Right. <laughs> of course, on board. Right. Bobby, it. it's so good at slowly and clearly, and this is a great trick for all writers, especially sci-fi writers. He introduces insane sci-fi lexicon building blocks one at a time until by the end you fully understand the workings of this entirely new system and world. He's really yeah. good at that. I love it. Yeah, and, and that aspect, as you describe it, it is very sirency, the way he does that. Especially yeah. that, oh, you will have a future death in space. And he's like, very... here's what harmoniums are. Here's yeah. their whole life cycle, so you feel like you understand their ecology. It's right. cool. Yeah, yeah. It's good sci-fi. It's like doing your due diligence as a good sci-fi author. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, they're holed up in a mansion, right? Yeah, and they, as they grow up, they are not just intelligent, they are actually very, very intelligent, and they will later realize that the source of their intelligence is when they are physically near each other. Especially if their heads touch, they become a ge one single genius by yep. melding their minds. And also, if they're far apart from each other, they become... Normal intelligence may be a little bit dumb. And so they But they've never been farther apart than the grounds of the mansion. Right. So they've always been close together. And we'll see later if they get separated even more, they go below normal intelligence, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or it becomes um, painful or sad in some way. It's a yeah. depressant. And remember, this is the whole thing is an analogy for the death of his real life sister, so I think that's really easy to track, right? He feels yeah. that his connection to her fueled a lot of what's beautiful about the works of Kurt Vonnegut, the, the legendary author. And he feels like without her, how is he going to go on? He's going to be dumb now. Right, yeah. So it's a, it's it's beautiful. a metaphor for that. Yeah. They also realize that there's this huge staff there to wait on them hand and foot because their parents think that they're stupid. And so they start to decide as they grow and become intelligent that they need to continue to pretend to be stupid because otherwise these small town Vermont people will lose their paying work taking care of them. 
And yeah. so if they remain stupid, it will be a good service to the small town Vermont folks who need jobs because otherwise they're just stuck in this and town. They, yeah. And they say like they told us in so many thousand little ways that that's the way they wanted the system to be maintained. Yeah. So like imagine everyone thinks you're mentally challenged, but you're not. But since birth, people have been like cooing over you and saying like, and you overhear things like this cushy job where I get to live in this mansion is so nice. I hope I never lose it. Right. And so they basically decide that they live in a world it's a lot like the trap story smart bunny they realize quote unquote and he says later in retrospect i think i was right i think we were right yeah they realize that <laughs> dumb people do better in the world than smart people and people want you to be dumb being too smart is threatening and bizarre being dumb is more like what everyone is and like right. less threatening and you get along and they want people to like them. They don't care about being smart and ambitious. So they just want to get along with everyone at the house. So they literally never speak. He says <laughs> they blow snot out their noses and fart and say, bah and duh. And my favorite is one of his favorite catchphrases is flock a butt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just a series of syllables he says a lot. So like the butler will comb his hair and say like now what do we say and he'll go flock a butt and they'll go very good. <laughs> very well done. Great. True. Uh so everyone thinks they're doing great for kids who are mentally challenged who are expected to die, but of course secretly they are of genius level intelligence. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's implied if not explicitly made clear, it's because they were born with a natural ability to link their minds psychically, right. which the Chinese l have discovered how to do, I guess, some, somehow through like experimentation. Yeah. But they have the natural gift, so when they're together, they have double brain. <laughs> yeah, they do. And they also uh, they find out that the mansion is full of secret passages, and they use those to move around and be smart secretly while they're outwardly stupid to staff. And then they also read the entire massive library in the house, so right. that makes them more intelligent. So it's totally a superhero origin story. Yeah, it's a little they, bit Wayne yeah. Manor. Yeah. They're locked in Wayne Manor, and they have secret identities where they're secretly constantly 100 hours a day or whatever, <laughs> training their brains until they're amazingly... Yeah. So we get the idea that they're super geniuses by the time they come of age. And they even, they hide all these writings they make of all these theorems and theses and doctoral works that the academic community would flip out about if they ever got out, but they just keep them in the mausoleum the mausoleum of the Swain family on their grounds, they just roll them up and put them in a vase and like leave them there. Yeah, right. <laughs> and they're like, these are the interesting things that we like. It's like our clubhouse. We don't care to share it with anyone. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and they also are visited annually on their birthday by their parents. Their parents can only stand to see them that often. Now that they know they're going to live the whole time, they feel right. bad, so they come once a year. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Wilbur and Eliza keep up the show of being mentally challenged for them at each birthday. And then on their 15th birthday, they overhear their parents finally snapping and not being able to take it yeah. anymore. By and... the way, by the time they're this old and this big, they're described as two meters tall, which is just over six feet, which is not that big. But yeah. but they're also described as, because of their, their like Neanderthal bodies, right. without trying, they can knock walls down, break people's arms. So like people are also scared of them. Now they're like <laughs> Lenny from Mice and Men, where everyone's like, yeah. keep them calm because they could destroy us. Right. Yeah, so. Yeah, with like a, a Marfan syndrome kind of look. Exactly. Uh, yeah, sure. And so they, their parents finally snap. They say that they hate themselves because they had wished their kids would just die. And that's a horrible, you know, feeling to have as a parent. And Wilbur and Eliza overhear this and say... From a hidden chamber. Yeah, because of the secret yeah. pastures and everything. And say, they say, why don't we give our parents a wonderful gift? And so they Right, well, because the... Themselves. Sorry to interrupt, but no, sure. just to tag on, the mom says, yeah, we wish they were dead. And the dad's like, it's okay. Don't blame yourself. It's only natural, like anyone would be frustrated by like these imbeciles that will never have any intelligence. So they think, oh, everyone wants us to switch now. Right. Like that, oh, okay. Well, we're <laughs> smart, so that's easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they're like, great. So they just dress up nicely and show up and, and say, oh, hello, father. You know, and... Uh, what is the... I think I can find the quote. They like walk down the stairs in tuxedos and an evening gown and are like... Evening, Mater and Pater. <laughs> right. We wanted to inform you that, like, we thought you wanted us to be dumb, but you'll see we're quite geniuses. Yeah, yeah. And then they, they promise to keep the staff employed. They also, Wilbur says in that moment, as they do this presentation, he realizes that their father and mother 
still can't really fully love them because it's just too much of a switch and too painful of a realization on its own. Well, he says in retrospect, obviously, 80 years later, he says, Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't blame them. It jumps back and forth because he's writing a journal to his present thoughts as a hundred year old man. But so at one point he says, Yeah, it's perfectly natural human instinct to hate something that looks grotesque and monstrous. Yeah. And I don't even blame my parents now that enough time has passed. We thought, oh, they wanted us to be smart. We'll just be smart, and now everything will be fixed. But it's even more grotesque for something you thought was like a mentally handicapped Neanderthal to come down in a tuxedo and start telling you how it's going to run the household now. So they're like, we didn't understand that, but naturally our parents felt even worse because now they have been mistreating their children this whole time, and their children were smart. And... They don't want to admit it, but it, now they feel they now have to like let them out of the mansion, right? Because they're human beings. Now right. everyone gets to see their horrible Neanderthal monster <clears throat> children, and they feel guilty that they feel embarrassed about that. So it's like the whole natural, and he's like, I get it. It's human instinct for them to have hated us more than anything, So they and they did. Yeah, yeah. They hated that we were intelligent even more than they hated us when we were dumb. And they're so naive, they're like, Oh shit, they pick up on the vibe and they try to be dumb again. So she like blows a snot right. bubble and he shits his pants <laughs> and the parents start weeping and they're like, We don't understand what you want. <laughs> yeah. Because like that's even worse now, like watching them play out. <laughs> right. It just gets every step uh, ruins it more. And then from there, they uh, are going to, they've been being cared for by a doctor named Dr. Mott. But then the family brings in another doctor named Cordelius Swain Cordoner. Because they're like, Dr. Mott, you should have picked up on the fact that they were faking. You're fired. Yeah, yeah. right, right. The only reason I bring him up again and interrupt again is no, no. because later, and we skipped past this because it jumps back and forth in time. Dr. Mott is the grandfather of the king of Michigan. Yeah, And just a vignette I think is really important to the theme of the book is in chapter three, it cuts ahead in time and he says one time I was sitting with the king of Michigan who just so happens was the grandson of Dr. Mott who raised us when we were kids and was a real asshole (laughs) and seemed depressed all the time and I asked him why do you think your grandpa was so depressed and hated life so much our lives were way harder and he was rich and he seemed to have everything do you know like was he saddled with a mental handicap like why was he so sad and the important part or the Blurt, I guess I should have saved it for Blurt, no, right. is the King of Michigan says, God, I don't know. What kind of American knows anything about their grandparents, for Christ's <laughs> sake? And that's one of the huge points of the book. And I think why he has the Chinese culture become the dominant culture in yeah. some ways is because he's talking about how one of the things America has lost is our culture is alienating of the family unit. And yeah. your family unit in American culture is only you, your spouse, and your children. Like, you don't feel a strong connection to your grandparents, to your cousins. It's been very diluted compared to other cultures around the world. And the idea that the King of Michigan would be like, that's an American thing, is to not know shit about your family. And that weakens you to have no roots and no culture and no background. Yeah, yeah. So there's that. (laughs) <laughs> and I've completely diverted us, so I forget where we are in the real plot. So no, you have to save point. us. So they get tested by Dr. Cordelia Swain Cordner. The new doctor. And whose she, middle name is Swain? Right. Her is she related name, to them? I forget. She's like vaguely related and hates herself for it because she wishes she was an up by her bootstraps person, but she has some right. rich blood in her. Yeah. And so she there's a lot of back and forth about that. And she also tests their intelligence officially because the parents are like, okay, they're intelligent. They're, they're getting toward being adults. We need to figure out what to do with them now. And they promise they will get a perfect score. Yeah, they, they do. They're like, trust those parents. We're smart. It's right, not right. going to be a problem. Uh, but and, she separates them. <laughs> right. So she tests them separately and they freak out because they're like, oh, no, no, we're dumb if we don't do that. And they also say that they have come up with, they hate being apart so much that they even come up with a nickname for the identities they have when they're separate and they don't have each other, which is Betty and Bobby Brown. Like they have to treat it as a whole different identity when they're separated and stupid. So he's like, of course I failed the test. I'm Bobby Brown right now, which is a dumb guy. It's like a name for his dumb alter ego. And they eventually complain to the point where the parents are like, well, can you please let them do it? Right. The doctor doesn't want to. 
But they're like, look, if it won't hurt, let them take the test together and see if they get a genius score. So they finally let them retake the test together, and it turns out <laughs> something we didn't know till now, because the narrator finally fills us in, that when they put their brains together, like just literally like physically lean their heads together or even in the same room, they're pretty smart. Yeah. But when they're thinking really hard and like solving a problem and when they come up with these theories of gravity and theories of relativity and shit that are genius level, they basically have to fuck. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, it's a little bit unclear exactly what it is for Mass Describe, but it's pretty much sex. But Kurt, as the narrator, uses the word incest. Like he says, yeah. this book is about incest in part. So there's no insertion. <laughs> and he says it's non-sexual, meaning like they aren't feeling sexual arousal. Rousal. Yeah. They're feeling the thrill of discovery and thinking and science and stuff. Right. But physically... They have to mash their body, naked bodies together really hard. Right. And like he said, and it really helps if they're like sniffing each other's crotches. It, it, it boosts their brain yeah. power. And that just happens to be the way it is set up physically and there's nothing they can do about it. Yeah. And so they're really like, I lo just love the ending is I'm paraphrasing, but he's like, anyway, we aced the test. The next day I was sent to a home for severely disturbed children. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And they, uh, they were like, I also, I don't know how physically they would have done all that action and taken a test. I don't like, understand it totally. Like filled in bubbles on a scantron. Sense, yeah. But uh, it's fine. So yeah, the family's plan becomes, oh, they need to be apart forever. <laughs> and uh, like they're disgusting, perfect right. monsters. <laughs> and so they send Wilbur to a school for disa uh, disturbed boys and they just keep Eliza in the house because the... The diagnosis is Wilbur, his half of their intellect could be like a manual laborer or something, you know? And they said that he could Eliza, work at a gas station, maybe. Right. <laughs> and then Eliza, her half of their intellect will never be a functional adult, and she just needs to be supervised the rest of her life. And he says the reason that is is because she was sort of the right brain and he's the left brain. So, like, when they were yeah. put together, he learned to read and write and do math. But he never had the ideas. She would be the one to say that, well, if that's true mathematically, wouldn't that mean gravity was variable in the past? And he'd be like, oh, shit, I never would have thought of that. But as a result, she only has intuition and she doesn't read or write or do math. So right. if on IQ tests, they're like, oh, she's the dumb one. Even though, of course, he thinks she's the smarter one, which I think is a parallel for how Vonnegut has all this fame and recognition and she's just some lady who's only famous for being his sister, but I'm sure he thinks of her and thought of her as just as smart and vibrant inside as he is, if not smarter. Yeah. You know? yeah and yeah. yet she was never famous for all of her great thoughts, but he is. Right. <laughs> and this guy, Wilbur, will become the president of the United States, <laughs> like through no credit of his own, really. <laughs> yeah. And in a process that he doesn't even really describe I the understand. details of. We actually, as a narrator, when he becomes like, president, yeah, you know. he's like blacked out on drugs at the. Right. And he's like, I, and then I ran for president, I guess, and I won. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And but not yet. So they, Wilbur goes to the school. He manages to, from there, go to college and then go, end up at Harvard Medical School. Meanwhile, Eliza is cloistered off in the house the whole time. Also, also, very importantly, he says from the moment he's driven away, he begins to forget. Like, yeah. so I just want people to know when he's at school and everything, his state of mind is... His fam he says, my family told me I had a sister, Eliza. And I was like, oh, yes, I dimly remember like a girl in a vegetative state who's better off in an asylum. Right. That's right. The whole thing. Like he immediately forgets that he cares about her or that she was connected to him. Yeah. And he and, describes it as protection from trauma. That like the brain yes. just shuts it off. Yeah. Because he knows there's no way back to her and he just forgets it. But he kind of becomes a self-centered douchebag. Yeah. Or at least in like he really enjoys because... Of course, he exceeds all expectations. They thought he'd be a gas station attendant, but he's smart enough to go to Harvard. Again, he's not Einstein, but he's real smart. So everyone's impressed. People write articles about him because he's the very smart, weird-looking guy who's going to Harvard Medical School. And uh, pretty girls at school start to like him and go out with him and have sex with him because he's so uniquely ugly-looking. Yeah. <laughs> it's a novelty. So he actually has a fairly decent sex life. Even though later he says he has the genitals of a baby field mouse. But, um, yeah, that just gets tossed off in the middle of it, yeah. But so he's going through this like playboy phase where he's still rich and he's pretty smart. So, of course, plenty of people will overlook that he's hideously ugly. 
he's a goddamn Rockefeller doctor of medicine from Harvard. Right. So he leads a pretty baller life and completely forgets Eliza. Yeah, yeah. Then uh, their father dies, and Norman Mushari Jr., who is the son of Norman Mushari from God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, <laughs> shows up and helps Eliza sue Wilbur and sue their mom for part of the inheritance and also for locking her away. And to get her out of the asylum, to get right. her legally sprung. They let her win the case, and so she buys half of the New England Patriots football team, uh, which it's, is just silly. Wilbur and his mom feel so guilty, they don't put up any legal defense. And then from there, we have Eliza track down Wilbur and confront him about their separation and about what happened between them and they fight and they argue and then from there they end up reuniting in a five-day orgy where they tie up anyone who tries to stop them and... wait did you gloss over the helicopter though that that's later i think okay okay gotcha yeah. oh right she comes in and is just like really like fuck you i don't want anything to do with you yeah for a while i'll see you in court and he's like i don't even recognize you you're this bent over hunched like withered old woman yeah she's and, been drinking and smoking that's right. and, and and then she drops her facade and is like touch me and mm -hmm. you're like you as the reader obviously you're like oh here it goes something crazy is gonna happen right yeah yeah so they get together and do that and they end up tying up everyone who tries to stop them only going out for food briefly and writing an entire book in the middle of it over the course of five days that they don't remember where they were just naked the whole time except when they went to buy food and like snorfling each other's crotches and writing right. a book. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, which when, again, don't know how you mechanically do it. But, when they yeah. were done, they uh, were able to publish a book on child rearing called The Cry of the Nocturnal Goat Sucker by Betty and Bobby Brown. Yeah. The only thing the publishers changed was the title because it's fucking insane and makes no sense. <laughs> they just changed it to like child rearing. No, they made it so, so you went and had a baby. So you went and had a baby. Yeah. But it was originally called The Cry of the Nocturnal Goat Sucker <laughs> as an in-joke because that's what they call the whippoorwill. Yeah, yeah. A nocturnal goat sucker as an in-joke between them. But anyway, then, the, end, the point being the child rearing book was so well written as to become the third best-selling book of all time behind The Bible and The Joy of Cooking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's like, was it popular? Oh, you know, kind of. It was only the third most popular book in the history of books. Of all of time, books. yeah. And then Eliza leaves after this because she's feeling shame from this orgy they've done. And Wilbur says he never sees her again. He'll hear her voice twice more Before after, she dies, after yeah. medical school graduation and while he's the president. And she moves to Machu Picchu because all the rich people who are not Chinese have been kind of gathering there and building a last it's stand. It's like the Cayman Islands of, yeah. yeah, as the world is falling apart, except for China, the rich people decided, or it's the Switzerland during World War II, that's like where to flee. Yeah, Everyone's like they build to condos Machu Picchu on it. For so. some reason. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's in this same passage, incidentally, that we briefly cut ahead in time for the hundred year old narrator to say, and of course, now I know all the secrets about life, death, and the afterlife, how the afterlife sucks, and so on, which is just a huge bomb to drop that is not explained. Yeah. And I love it because that's yeah. going to become the main focus of the second half of the book. Yeah. So he says, like, I'll only hear Eliza's voice twice more, then she'll die. Of course, now I know that the afterlife is terrible. Anyway, more on that later. <laughs> <laughs> from there, he graduates from Harvard Medical School. Eliza flies over it in a helicopter and just, I think, shouts at him. For they have a big graduation party. Yeah. He's at his graduation party at like one of the Rockefeller, you know, big apartment buildings. And someone comes in and tells him he has a visitor who wants to see him outside, which is it's facing Central Park, I think. And he walks around outside and there's a helicopter hovering above Central Park. Yeah. And it's Eliza with a bullhorn and he can't see her face because it's night and there's spotlights. But basically they have a brief conversation. That's one of the two times he'll hear her voice before she dies. Yeah. And then also Dr. Mott shows up in person and gives him a note of if you can do no good, at least do no harm hippocrates and then from there we fast forward through decades of wilbur's life he has a wife and he has a son he loses both of them he doesn't do a good he, job caring for either of them i would right. say right and he says he's bad at love and bad at being a person toward these people uh he in a moment of uh well i guess we're not there yet he takes the first pill after the gravity shift right yeah okay so we'll hold um, that off on that he turns the mansion in vermont that he grew up in into a doctor's practice and a children's Pediatrician hospital Pediatrician clinic. Yeah. he tries to work there and he's then while they're visited by fu manchu the tiny emissary of the chinese 
who asks to see the manuscript that he and Eliza wrote when they were kids. And so he finds it and shows it to him. In the and, mausoleum. Yeah. yeah. And it happens to include, among other things, their idea that everyone should have an artificial middle name to create families. And it also includes their thoughts on gravity. And the gravity stuff is the part that Fu Manchu is there for. Fu Manchu sees it, discovers it. And then in one moment, shortly after that, Wilbur finds out from his letter mail that Eliza has gone to Mars, and he later learns that Eliza tipped off the Chinese that there were secrets to gravity in the urn, and then in exchange, they would take her to their colony on Mars. And she was like, great, I'll go to Mars instead of Machu Picchu. And Wilbur finds out that she got there. There's another letter in the mailbox that says One she died in later. an avalanche. One yeah. week later, he gets a message from Fu Manchu saying she was killed in an avalanche of fool's gold on Mars. Right. And then in that moment, as he's reading it, Earth's gravity massively increases and everything crashes down. And he assumes that the secrets of gravity he gave to the Chinese were either misused or used properly to rapidly change the gravity on Earth. Yeah, because after that point, gravity becomes a tidal system that flows and ebbs. So he's wondering if, like the A-bomb test, maybe that first instance where gravity, and it became known as like, you know, a global event that day, uh, whether that cataclysm was like their first test of the gravity machine, whatever it may be. We never find out explicitly. But so he's literally holding the telegram that says your sister's dead. And he says, I can't tell whether it was grief or the real thing. Yeah. But simultaneously, <laughs> as the grief of her death hit me, gravity on Earth massively increased, killing most of the population of Earth, leveling any building above, you know, a few stories. Yeah. So like this is the beginning of the apocalypse. From this point forward, there won't be any cars. People will go back to horse and buggies, yeah. blah, 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 blah. So that's the apocalyptic event. And after that, gravity varies wildly. And then, and then the other thing in his mail is a just sample from, I think it's Eli Lilly, of a kind of pill called Tribenzo de Portamil. He decides in the moment, I guess if gravity is like this, I should just take two of these, and then becomes a lifelong addict of For this 30 drug. For 30 years, yeah. yeah. It's an anti tourette syndrome drug, and he becomes addicted to it because it makes him feel calm. Yeah, yeah. Kurt's theme of pills affecting the brain, which he loves, because it was a new invention in his life. I right, think that's right. why he's so into it. It's I like think so, too. He yeah. witnessed it becoming a thing, yeah. Yeah. So he's obsessed with the idea that a little white pill can affect your mood. Yeah. And uh, from there, their mother dies two weeks later. And then in a blur of being addicted to pills, Wilbur closes the hospital. He becomes a senator from Vermont and then runs for president on the slogan right. of lonesome no more. So the apocalypse is unfolding and technologies are failing, but it's implied now you don't explicitly get the whole details, but obviously that the government exists in some form or limps along. Yeah. And right about the point when the government's going to dissolve, he's elected president. So he will end up being the last president of the United States. Yeah. And his, his whole platform is that he's going to create these artificial middle name families for people and right. take care of them. And he has no other plans as president. Yes. And it's the plan that he and Eliza came up with in their childhood. And the plan's slogan, which is his campaign slogan or the plan's title, so to speak, is lonesome no more. And is basically his whole campaign speeches are about how the evil and the trauma in our life is not from us being sinful, hateful people. It's because everyone's scared and lonesome and the people to find happiness <laughs> are the people to find a family and a place to belong and a support network. So a, a government machine is going to arbitrarily give you these middle names. And the way it works real quick yeah. is you get a noun, hyphen, and a number. If you meet someone and you're like, oh, you're a daffodil, I'm a daffodil, then you're cousins. Or you're an 11, I'm an 11, you're cousins. Right. If you meet someone who, oh, we're both daffodil 11s, brother, like right, you embrace. Right. So it's just sheerly making, you meet everyone and you get to see by comparing your middle names how unlikely it is that you met. And if you're a match, you get super excited or whatever. Yeah. And if you're not a match, you have some ability to say, oh, well, then someone from your family will help you with this problem. I'm going to move on. Right. Great. And people try to critique it. And there's a whole passage where he basically explains why this would be a good idea. People say, well, what about why do I have to like a stranger? And he's like, well, I have cousins I hate. I didn't say you have to like everyone that's related to you. People don't like people that are related to them. Yeah. But here's the benefits of it. And uh, we can't get into it in detail because it's basically reading the book. But there's a good chapter and a half 
of Vonnegut explaining this idea and why he thinks it's a good idea. Like, I really think he really thinks it's a, like, he wishes yes. it would happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially in his essays in Wampir's Foma and Grand Falloons, he talks so much about loneliness being the big problem we all need to and, fix. Yeah, yeah, I think he legitimately... He's a true believer of that. Yeah. At least thinks that's the pressing issue of our time, if not also thinks this is a solution yeah. for it. Alienation, yeah. yeah. And he, he even, uh, once Wilbur's elected president, is using old Nixon papers to help power the computers, like they're burning them or something. Oh, yeah. Power. They and he burn says, all the speeches of Nixon from the Library of Congress yeah. to power the machine to make the names. And that's straight up just because Vonnegut hated Nixon. That's yeah. got to be just a slam. Yeah, because yeah. he, had, he had resigned two years earlier. He erases him from history. And he, and he also says, even Nixon's crimes were motivated by loneliness because he wanted to join the family of criminals, because at least that's a family. <laughs> I, I don't think he was evil. I think he just saw brotherhood in corrupt officials. He was like, there's a family I could be a part of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wilbur also marries a 23-year-old named Sophie Rothschild. She On leaves... his 70th birthday. Right. Disgusting, dude. And she <laughs> leaves him mainly because she's so disgusted by the middle name situation and because her middle name is Peanut 3, which she feels is beneath her and too much of a ground-hugging noun. Peanut sucks and 3 is too low of a number. She yeah. wanted to be like Eagle 99 or something good because she used to be a Vanderbilt and she's like pissed off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. And it's also funny. He says, as the 100-year-old man, he's like, I don't know if it's cosmic justice or whatever, but I must say, the Peanuts did turn out to be like a shitty family. Yeah, <laughs> like, through really sheer funny. odds, all the Peanuts have an unusually high incidence of being like shiftless criminals and shit. <laughs> <laughs> right, like she was kind of right. So she leaves him. And then the... Country- and the, Yeah, the plague hits. Yeah. Uh, so he's hanging out in the White House, but the... Country basically doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, the country disintegrates to the point where there's no more America about two thirds of the way through his second term. He gets reelected, yeah. but then it's it. There's no uh, more electricity. He doesn't have any way to get communication from the outside world. So he keeps living in the White House, but there's no any, he's not really yeah. the president, really. The country also adopts a dominant religion, which is the Church of Jesus Christ, the kidnapped. And the church believes that Jesus is, has been stolen and hidden away well, by people. Yeah, they believe and so Jesus the, has returned. That's why everything's so apocalyptic. Yeah. We just got to find him. Where is right. that sucker? And so adherents <laughs> are just constantly looking around physically all of the time. Like they're always jerking their neck around trying to spot him. And Wilbur is holed up in the White House pretty much on his own. There are fewer and fewer calls, and then he's just there. He's taking he also, drugs. He says the side effect of the drugs is it made him love to count things. So he's just yeah. like on drugs, wandering around the White House, counting how many pillars there are in the hallway and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. And also feeling confident. He's just always <laughs> feeling good. He feels great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he gets one letter from a widow in Urbana, Illinois, saying that her husband, Felix Bauxite 13 von Peterswald, figured out a way to talk to the dead. It uses a particle accelerator with like a lunch pail on top of it, and you can just talk to people in the afterlife. And they've spoken to his dead sister, Eliza, and she needs to talk to him, so he needs to come to Urbana. She's writing him to say your sister wants to talk to you from beyond the grave. Come yeah. here. Yeah. And he... Uh, at the same time, though, two people show up at the White House. Right. One is carrying the letter. Yeah. And the other one is a dude in a full, like, clean Air Force One Secret Service, like, pilot garb. Yeah. And he's like, let me guess, Halloween? <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and the guy whose name turns out to be Bernard V. O'Hare, of course. Or B, I can't remember. Just, no, no middle initial. Oh, he's just, just Bernard, Bernard O'Hare. O'Hare. Yeah. Kurt's real life best pal. Yeah. Is like, what the fuck's going on? Yeah. Because he was assigned to be the president's <clears throat> secret crisis helicopter pilot. Right. And he's been sitting in a bunker with a fully fueled helicopter for like 11 years. <laughs> yeah. So he's just been waiting this out. And he finally came out to ask what's going on and why he's no one ever talks to him or what's going on. Yeah. And he's like, oh, really? Well... I have to fill you in on a lot. And he fills him in on everything that's happened. Right. And then their their plan is, because there's also one me- only one remaining member of the White House staff who was a dishwasher who happened to also be a Daffodil 11. So, so he, he feels refuses like a brother to leave because right. he's his brother of the president. And so Carlos the dishwasher and President Wilbur and then pilot Bernard V. O'Hare, or just Bernard O'Hare, they say, okay, we'll take the helicopter. We'll fly to Indianapolis to drop off Carlos because there's a lot of daffodils there and he can have a family. Then we'll go to Urbana to talk to my dad's 
sister. Then I'll go back to Vermont and like retire or something. That's the plan. And then he says, and then your gift is please take the helicopter, the remaining fuel, go wherever you want, live yeah. your own post apocalyptic life. It's on you now. Yeah. And yeah. I dub the Eagle One because the guy was like, oh, all this middle name shit happened, and I didn't get one. And he's like, fine, <laughs> you're Eagle One. And, and he's, he's like, like, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> It felt like that life aquatic scene where Willem Dafoe gets to lead the second squad. Yes, like, totally. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then so when they do land in Urbana, which is a big daffodil city, it turns or Indianapolis. out. Indianapolis. Sorry, Indianapolis, yeah. which is a big daffodil city, just meaning a lot of people who happen to have the middle name Daffodil wound up there. Yeah. He's greeted so warmly, and he witnesses how the government works, what like the little local government that still exists, so compassionately and so well that it gives him full confidence that the middle name system was a great system. Yeah. He wishes it could have been implemented earlier. And I think that's Vonnegut's way of saying, you guys should really do this. <laughs> like, really, I think it would be good. Before it's too late. Exactly. Yeah. So this is saying, oh, well, they came upon the idea too late, but look how nice and compassionate these people are as they march towards death and even bernard is like i wish i was a daffodil instead of a stupid eagle after he sees how nice all the daffodils treat him because he's a daffodil yeah and i think then they just let him be a daffodil They're like, okay, oh yeah that's right he says yeah. fine then you're a daffodil because also it's the apocalypse <laughs> so everyone's like we're all brothers and sisters now fuck it yeah yeah and he gets and... to find out a bunch of stuff about how the system worked <laughs> All the people who had 13s would have these secret clubs called 13 Clubs with black cats and spider webs and shit that no yeah. one else was allowed in. Yeah, like horror stuff. Which so he basically tours the town finding out that his system worked really well, even though it didn't have a chance to work early enough. Yeah, even though everything fell apart anyway. Yeah. yeah. And he also, as they were flying, flew over the Battle of Lake Max and Cookie, which is a lake in Indiana where the King of Michigan's forces were fighting the Duke of Oklahoma's forces. And he said it was a pretty lackadaisical battle because there weren't any machines. It was just humans with implements kind of going at each other. And he says that at least it wasn't a massacre. And then instead of going straight to Urbana, he accepts an invite from the King of Michigan to go meet him at the King's like palace on Lake Max and Cucky now because yeah. he won and he built this thing there. And so he goes and meets with the King and they... Who basically wants him to admit the apocalypse has happened. America doesn't exist. You're not the president anymore. Yeah. I am the captain now. <laughs> and he, the King of Michigan makes Wilbur sign a document saying that the Louisiana Purchase belongs to the King of Michigan. Right. And Wilbur's like, yeah, sure, fine. And he'll never try to raise a U.S. Army or fight him or anything. Yeah, right, he gives right. up. <laughs> and then he's like, fine, can we go? And from there he goes yeah, he's to... like, I don't really care. Yeah. Also, I love he says... I made my signature as tiny as I could, like a little ant. And then I said, <laughs> here's America. Have it in good health. <laughs> like, I don't give <laughs> right. a shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And from there, he finally goes on to Urbana. He speaks to Eliza through the through the afterlife. It sounds like the afterlife is very boring. They call blame. it the turkey farm. Yeah. You don't get a lot of details. I, can, I always confuse this with... Because in, uh, you know, is it Cat's Cradle where we get the depiction of it as a felt pool table? I, and I always think that's from this, but it's not. It's basically, it's very vague. They just say... Isn't it? Well, I think Slaughterhouse is where it's a violet light and a hum. Is that right? It's just a violet light and a hum. Yeah. And one of them, it's like a giant pool table with an arch in the center. And that's yeah, all. Right. And people just hang out chatting. And they're like, don't you need it to be bigger? And they're like, no. <laughs> Only like 40 people have ever made it to heaven. Yeah. Um, and I always, I kept thinking that was from this, but no. The afterlife in this is unspecifiably bad. Yeah. And I love the metaphor of like, why would you think it would be a reward? Why wouldn't it be like school? Like you've lived through this life and you should have learned shit. Now when you die, you go to an even more difficult, more tiresome existence <laughs> that will require more patience and wisdom from you. Yeah. Um, so the implicate they call it the turkey farm, and the implication is just that it's tedious and difficult there. <laughs> yeah. It's also sort of fascinating to me that sort of like how in various books, Trelfa Midorians will be aliens, but with different attributes a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like his afterlives are... They match, but there's different specifics and there's different exact meanings to them. And he totally. sort of shifts around what heaven's going to be depending on what he's trying to pull off in the book. Exactly. Yeah. Although it is, I think, very important to say that it does seem like you can change heaven because that's why she wants to talk to him. Yeah. Like, it's not doomed forever. Eliza says to him, the reason I called you here is please shoot yourself in the head right now. Yeah. Uh, or kill yourself in any fashion because life is, who cares? Right. Come here. I need your help because I'm dumb right now. 
there we'll there's systems together. here and they suck and we can make them better yeah but people need to i need your head to touch mine so we can improve heaven because it's pretty shitty yeah which is a cool yeah. ask i think yeah. it also really reminded me of a family guy joke where he looks in the mirror of a bathroom and his ancestor speaks to him and at the end he asks him what's heaven like and he's like it's fine there's a shortage of chairs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I just love that joke. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly... I love just boring, this. Yeah. boring heaven is really funny right. idea. Yeah. And, and just only that detail. You don't yeah. know anything else. And he seems really ominous. Like, long it, lines. You know? It's like, yeah. 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 To get into what? I have to fade away now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, Wilbur takes this instruction and he says, okay... I'm going to fly uh, straight to Manhattan because that's where I will die because there's so much disease there. The Green Death is there. And yeah. there is also a popular theory that the Green Death might just be that the Chinese have miniaturized themselves so much that they are now spore sized and they live in our bloodstreams and kill us. Right. <laughs> so he says, I flew to New York to inhale disease or Chinaman and hopefully die quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he, that was his plan. But. The family of raspberries on Manhattan has discovered that if you eat a little bit of fish guts, that's an antidote to the Green Death. So as soon as he arrives, they immediately force him to eat fish guts and he has to stay alive. Because they find out he's a doctor. Right. And, and that's in obviously incredibly valuable in the post-apocalypse. Yeah. And so yeah. they use his medical services to heal them. And then from there, we get the point he's at where he's writing this. He's an old man on the island. His birthday's coming up. He's got his granddaughter and his her granddaughter lover. granddaughter and her and lover, yes. Vera's slaves. Yes. <laughs> and importantly, he skips you finding out how he reunited with his granddaughter because that's the epilogue. Right. Which yeah. I think is really important that it's not in, in the journal. And, and then is it just his birthday party? Yeah. The very last thing he writes about is that they held his birthday in the, I think it's the lobby of the Empire State Building, and they lit a hundred candles. And he says, as he stood, am as I stood among these candles from Vera, quote, I felt as though I were God up to my knees in the Milky Way. Epilogue. Epilogue. Time. First thing they tell you is that's the last thing in this person's journal. Then he died. Yeah. And then the epilogue, per whoever's writing the epilogue, you never know who it is. And it's not really in the style of Kurt. It's even more narratorly, I would say. Yeah, it's, it's very, very it's traditional. Like, the end of Animal House. It's like, now here's the facts that you might want to know about the rest of the story. Because yeah. there was a bunch of shit left up in the air. Um, oh, and in the epilogue, we learn, I think, more of what Eliza and Wilbur talked about. We've already dipped into the epilogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've dipped into... In fact, that's what's crazy about the epilogue. The whole scene we described where you find out the punchline that the afterlife is tedious and when he dies, he'll be reunited with this blah, 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 blah. That's all in the epilogue. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Would, So we're already into the epilogue. And uh, he also, he gives his last few pills to a kid who has Tourette's and kept interrupting the afterlife conversation. He spends six days in horrible withdrawal. While he's doing that, he conceives a child with the lady keeping him there while he's in withdrawal. It's the widow from Urbana whose husband discovered the afterlife technology. Yeah. Her son has Tourette's. She cares for him while he's withdrawing. They have sex and she bears a child. Yeah. And then that guy Who fathers... he ditches, by the way. Right. He bounces. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, that guy fathers his granddaughter, Melody. She ends up working her way to Manhattan and then she unites with Wilbur and then they become that little family in Manhattan. Yeah, and that's the last image of the epilogue. And I think it's important to note how important Vonnegut thought it was, like that scene, because it takes up an undue amount of page space. Yeah. Basically, it cuts back in time. And I think, again, it's just hammering home. Do you see how what we need is not love, but decency? Do you see how what we need is neighbors? Like, you don't need a soulmate. You need 10 neighbors who, at least in passing, care about your well-being. Because basically, they say... Here's the story of Melody, the person's granddaughter, because it's the narrator. Yeah. She was born, didn't know what the fuck anything was, like realized she lived in a post-apocalypse, should have probably despaired and just given up. But her mother, who passed away, always told her, you are the granddaughter of the last president of the United States, <laughs> king of candlesticks, who lives in the palace of the Empire State Building in New York. Yeah. And she's like, that's so fucking awesome that I'm important. <laughs> and that sort of sustained her. And it says, so she set out to find her legendary grandfather, who legend had it still lived. And her incredibly deadly journey was aided all along by strangers who didn't know her, who gave her a coat, who gave her a scrap of food, and at last by a guy who risked his life for no reason to row her to the Isle of Manhattan. Yeah. Hi-ho. So it's just saying at the end, do you see how easy it is 
if everyone was just nice, the world would be saved. <laughs> like, yeah, there's something so beautiful and just people just helped her out out of like neighborliness. He loves decency and neighborliness. <laughs> <laughs> and well, also that ending, I get that it also felt a little flat to me as an ending, just because it sort of that happens and then he just writes thus end the and that's oh i love that i'm tearing up like recapping oh, it right now yeah. except i don't but, understand why it says das Ende. i do wonder that yeah i don't either it's just sort of random german it I think, says again. the end in german at the end yeah maybe it's because that is the culture well we talked about this before uh we started recording right yeah it's just clicked for me he longs for connection to roots and his roots happen to be German culture. And that was stripped from him Yeah, as it talks, has been from Well, he talks me. a bit about it in the <laughs> intro that his very German family was taught to stop being German in the two yeah. world wars when they were the enemy. And I, I am a Schmidt. We're German people, but I, I grew up without the language, without any of that culture, without anything. For obvious, there's like a recent because event it's, because that it's makes weird. it weird to too strongly embrace like your German heritage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> das ist, das ist, yeah, yeah, but it could be, I think Das Ende could be him that could be, being like, yeah. I like that I'm German or I'm trying to get in touch with that. Because there are a couple other nods to German language and German culture in it. Yeah. And let's get into some other nods, nods. to things and bits yeah. we like yeah. in a segment, segment called, called Nods. Kurt Blurts. Oh, blurt, well, blurt, all I'm blurt, talking blurt, about is blurt, nods, blurt. nods. We're gonna nod, no blurt, nod, blurt, and nod, and blurt. blurt. No nods, just blurt. Oh, okay. Welcome to the <laughs> land of nod, where all we have is blurts. If you've never heard the show, this is a segment where we pick out particularly choice lines and moments and things that we love from the book that real, we didn't get to and summon it up. Real primo shit. <laughs> and honestly, I think I had less blurts than a usual Kurt Vonnegut novel in this one. I don't, I, have, I don't know if he was that as sharp as he usually is in this one. I would say that he was more restrained than usual. Yeah. I still, okay, I'm not going to make this my new favorite one, but I really, really liked it way more than I liked it the other several times I've read it in my life. Oh, wow. And maybe that's the effect of doing this podcast and having a richer understanding of where he's coming from. But I really, really liked it, especially in light of what we talked about, where in Breakfast of Champions, he's like, watch me reset. And I think he totally did amazingly. Like, the thing yeah. I wrote down is, oh, shit, this is Marvel Ultimates. Like, do you know the Ultimates? I don't, I don't know much about it. All right. It. So, like, Iron Man Ultimate, Spider-Man Ultimate, whatever. Marvel did this event where they're like, we'll start over with new authors Obviously, just a crass cash grab, but... Well, <laughs> comics refresh like that. Maybe right, they, so yeah. we're going to refresh and start the Iron Man story over. Some details will be the same. Some will be different. New writer, new new artists to sell to new generation of children. Yeah. And I was like, this is fucking Vonnegut Ultimate <laughs> because you're starting from scratch. So, like, Breakfast of Champions to me really represents the crescendo of a period of his life. And yeah. this is the beginning because the tone just, guys, it's so different. It's very, like, restrained and... And like concrete and he's like i can't say pooty weed anymore i'm gonna say whippoorwill instead <laughs> i can't say so it goes anymore i'm gonna say hi ho instead i can't have the church of god the utterly indifferent so i'll have the church of christ the kidnapped it is so sirens of titan with different elements <laughs> yeah i get that and i i think i was not knocked out by that i felt like it was sort of like i i've read this book once before and the one time i read it i, I was really into the middle name concept and then i felt, still and felt like a great concept. i felt like that lifted an otherwise just kind of okay book like it was that was great within a just fine book and reading it this time i was less knocked out by the middle names and still felt like it was just kind of fine and that it, it was things he'd done before but not as sharply or interestingly yeah I uh, so that's I could see that I could see that, but what I I think you see is like a loss of vitality, or there's less lines per minute that hit you. Yeah, I kind of see as an attempt to like make a more poetic version than Sirens, which is like a rambling adventure. And I appreciate that effort. That's all I'll say. Yeah, I also think yeah. there are themes that bear repeating. But you're li right, like. I shit on Force Awakens all the time for just being a recapitulation of plot points yeah. from the original trilogy shuffled around. This has some of that stink on it, sure. Yeah, I think I so. I mean, yeah. it's really like Sirens of Titan, the basic plot points, a <laughs> lot. The more you think about it, the more match up and you go, oh, they're so-and-so, they're so-and-so. Yeah. Eliza's very Beatrice-y uh, with a lot of her motivations and even the ways she moves the plot forward. 
But anyway, I yeah. agree. I have fewer blurts than usual, but I still think they're just as choice as my point. The blurts that are, are there are just as potent as ever. Yeah, and some of them are more emotionally resonant than others often are. Like, it's yeah. re- or a really particular way relationships work. It's we or require idea. more of a leap on the part of the reader to get the meaning out of. Yeah, I that's think true. he's more ar- obscure and arcane as he ages too. Yeah, there's definitely I because I I think I also like it better when when he's going to do a book grappling with a death in his family if he just talks about it directly i think i like that better like okay. the, the big metaphor of freaky twins with their heads coming together i, I it doesn't <laughs> work for me as a way right, to deal with right. his sister's death I don't, I don't know i don't know why i'm uh clearly you never it. snuffled your sister's crotch and that's <laughs> why you just can't get it man it's not for no you no sisters so <laughs> no. Not anymore, Checkmate. anyway. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I do have some, I have less than usual, but probably way more than I was supposed to, because I always do too many. No, it's great. <laughs> uh, do uh, uh, jump into one, or I'll find one. From the intro, this book depicts myself and my beautiful sister as monsters and so on. This is only natural, since I dreamed this story on the way to a funeral. And that, the thing that struck me about that is I realized all things are written on the way to a funeral. Your own feel. Ooh, like there's yeah. no writing created without the end point being your death ahead of you. <laughs> and I think that's what he meant by that. <laughs> yeah, but if not, I hadn't thought of it that way. But, but if not, it's probably... not as interesting a blurt as I think it is. <laughs> no, I didn't catch that. I think that seems like, like every thing. every book he's ever written is on the way to the funeral in a way. As yeah, as as our own. <laughs> yeah. There's a, another one from the prologue. He's talking about their family lost Germany and then money and then each other. And the line is, we were interchangeable parts in the American machine. And I think that's something he talked about a bit in Breakfast yep. Champions, too. Player I think piano, as certainly. Right, and directly there. But I think that's a, just a good thing to have early on and really sets up a lot of the yeah. vibes of it. He says of the Vanderbilts and Rockefellers, they were fabulously well-to-do and descended from Americans who had all but wrecked the planet with a form of idiot's delight, obsessively turning money into power and then power back into money again and then money back into power again. (laughs) Just a good, a usual Kurdism. You're like, yeah, that's something he would say. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) somewhat related when he's talking about the ancestors of the Swain family who were not rich, he says... They were innocent great apes with limited means for doing mischief, which, in my opinion, as an old, old man, is all that human beings were ever meant to be. Yep, that was the next one I had listed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Vana gets a real Luddite. He clearly believes there's some key technologies he wishes we had not invented. Yeah. yeah Arguably yeah. including, like, the combustion engine i think you would i think you, yeah maybe computers too. <laughs> maybe widespread communication yeah yeah i think so um, there's also this is yeah. sort of a brief recurring blurt is uh, at one point he says that when eliza and, and wilbur reveal that they're smart thus did eliza and i destroy our paradise our nation of two. Oh, and nation of two is a big modern night thing. so yeah. yeah this just comes up ah Man, I love that. This is more of an image that I just want to make sure we get to because I don't have it listed anywhere else. But in case you didn't read the book, I want you to know that Melody and Isidore spend most of their time waiting for days with light gravity so that they can hurl giant chunks of masonry and car pieces and stuff (coughs) into a massive pyramid larger than the pyramids at Giza. Yeah. Under which the child she miscarried is buried in a sewer. And it's called The Tomb of the Prince of Candlesticks. I just think it has so much cool sci-fi shit in it, man. Yeah. yeah. Like way more than his. It has at least eight awesome sci-fi things in it, which is why it gets me so much. Because most of his books have like three. Yeah. (laughs) Like this and maybe Galapagos are the closest he comes to like a Mad Max. I've never read that. uh, That's exciting. Yeah. Okay, cool. But the next blurt I have. Oh, I said that. Uh, it's natural for human beings to wish a quick death for monsters. <laughs> but yeah. uh, uh, I think one of the real important points in the book is brought out when Cordelia Swain, the doctor who eventually separates them ultimately, when she's alone with them, she drops her nice demeanor and says, this is the United States of America where nobody has a right to rely on anybody else, where everybody <laughs> learns to make their own way. And her slogan is, paddle your own canoe. Yeah. Canoes, which, by the way, famously work much more efficiently with more than one person in them. <laughs> or uh, even specifically two. Yeah, it's kind of built exactly. for that. It's yeah. great because you can do one side and the other <laughs> side. But yeah, I think that's, and that's the central, one of the like four central points here, absolutely, is wasn't the American dream one of like brotherhood and everyone, Yeah. I mean, even that's exclusionary language, like personhood and everyone being 
together in this like shared thing called the American dream? And how have we gotten to the point where a lot of people are like, America's hard. No one gives you a handout. You got to make it on your own. And you're like, I thought we were trying to make life less hard, not harder. Right. Like, why is that a real American just like pulls themselves up by their bootstraps and doesn't want any help? <laughs> like, that's hard, man. Right. That's rough. It's like since when? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and it's very God bless you, Mr. Rosewater. Like mm-hmm. She has a definite Lister Rosewater vibe. Fascists are inferior people who believe it when somebody tells them they're superior. That was so good. I was, yeah. I tweeted that this morning. Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> and also, yeah, this was really jumped out to me. Later in, that fascist line is Eliza being angry at Wilbur after they've separated and come back together. And then she also says, after he says why and, and how he feels about it, she says, but it sure helps a hell of a lot more than your expressions of guilt, I must say. Those are just boasts about your own wonderful sensibilities, which is a really incisive, like, oh, sometimes when people are like, but I did that, I feel so bad. It's like kind of celebrating themselves for feeling bad. Sometimes, but not all the time. Not all the time, for sure. She also says but, right after that, and of course you're proud of your guilt. It's the only thing you ever earned in your life. And I don't think that's yeah. true because Wilbur was half of the brain that came up with all the gravity shit. My point being, this scene really reminded me of the Rumford scene in Sirens of Titan, where he also is speaking through a megaphone from a heightened position, oh, yeah. explaining all the bullshit. And similarly to the Rumford scene, in this part, I was like, Eliza has Man. been the arbiter of perfect wisdom the whole book, but in this one scene, she seems petty to me. Like, it's a mix of yeah. wisdom and her true emotions of like, like she says, I sang every day my prince will come, someday my prince will come every day in the castle when I was locked away, and you never came, you swine. So like, she hates him, and that yeah. comes through. And God, that scene ripped my heart out. He yells, I love you. To the helicopter. She says, didn't we agree? No one should ever say that. It's like the dumbest thing to ever say to anyone. And he's like, <laughs> but you don't understand. I mean it in this moment. For the, yeah. I know what I'm saying. I love you. And she says, not I love you back. I can't remember. Oh, she says, may God guide the heart and mind of Wilbur Swain. Right. Which I don't, I don't fully, that doesn't sit right with me. I wish you'd said I love you too. <laughs> yeah, it just felt like clinical. Sad. Yeah, yeah, that's what I, so I mean, like she has her own emotional reality that filters what she says, even though she's usually wise about everything. I also thought it was really telling that she's immediately buried in fool's gold. Yeah. Like she thought Mars would be the answer and it's not. <laughs> <laughs> There's. A, it's also sad that, so she gave the Chinese the information to affect gravity, which ends up ending the world. She did so to fly to Mars. So she literally ended the world in order to get as far away from him as humanly possible, even though all they want is to be together. It's so sad. Yeah. And yet every step, all their motivations make sense. And it's just like, wow, life can twist you to the point where all the only path ahead of you is to completely act against everything you want. Yeah, it's just that <laughs> and the, then die in an avalanche. The pain of that separation, she just can't face the possibility yeah. of it again. And I think like that's that. why yeah. it's fool's gold. She thinks this hurts me. The answer is to run the opposite direction as hard as I can, and that's not the answer either. Yeah. Everything's complex and there's no escaping tragedy ultimately. Yeah. This is when Wilbur is in Indianapolis, which is a heavily daffodil city, and he's watching the local government work. The meeting is run by a seven-year-old black girl who's very, very capable and effective at running it. And uh, one young man in the crowd wants to go fight a war against the Duke of Oklahoma as soon as possible. An old man tells him, young man, you're no better than the Albanian influenza or the Green Death if you can kill for joy. Yeah. Yeah. And he says, I think in that section and that's the section where he's seeing how well his system worked everyone's really like solemn about having to send soldiers to war to fight the duke of oklahoma yeah and they're very choosy about who in the community is gonna go and even people who volunteer they're like calm down you have six kids you you can't leave (laughs) so it's and he says I realized that nations could never acknowledge their own wars as tragedies, but that families not only could, but had to. Good for them. Oh, yeah. And it's really, it is one of the great strengths of the thing is like, I mean, it even made me think of like a biker gang, let's say. It can be any group that identifies with each other. If there's a war and some people die, it's seen as a deep loss and everyone's sad and like we lost the thing, you know what I mean? But 
countries as a political organization cannot admit, for example, that, oh yeah, Vietnam, big mistake, we shouldn't have been there, those people died, probably for no reason, we should just not have done that. You're not allowed to say that because there's a political reality and political fallout. So by making the family unit the unit that decides who lives and who dies, there's much more humanity to the process, and that's really cool. Yeah. I think my last one's related. He is visiting the King of Michigan, who is uh, very obsessed with history. The King of Michigan loves to read history and talk about it. my last blur as well. And uh, (laughs) Wilbur thinks to himself, aside from battles, the history of nations seem to consist of nothing but powerless old poops like myself, heavily medicated and vaguely beloved in the long ago, coming to kiss the boots of young psychopaths. Oh, that's great. And I did write that down as a blurt. But I even love... Equally, the scene right after that, because first of all, it's fucking hilarious. He, uh, the king of Michigan, has all these scribes writing down in everything that happens every second. Right. And he goes, "Why are you doing that?" And he says, "You know the saying: we must study history, or we'll do them to repeat it." And he goes, "Oh yeah, no, right. We should write all this shit down. Otherwise, we might have the Chinese create a gravitational (laughs) aberration again, and the Green Death could sweep over the Earth again." Yeah. What the fuck are you talking about? Really funny. Yeah. Yeah. And it ends with him saying. To the scribes, history is nothing but a list of surprises. The only thing you can learn from it is, uh, oh no, do you have the exact quote? I don't want to fudge it. History is merely a list of surprises. It can only prepare us to be surprised yet again. Please write that down. Please write that down. (laughs) Great. Like, uh, (laughs) yeah. didn't you just say no to? All right, I got a couple more I'll race through. They ask Eliza, when Eliza's like, you guys ruined my whole childhood to her parents and brother. Everything's ruined. They say, well... Does it make you any better, feel any better to know that your mother has felt horrible guilt about it her whole life and wishes she was dead for all the pain she's caused you? And that's such a standard response. And I love her response, which you should use in your own life in times of tragedy, which is, how could that help? That's the dumbest question I've ever heard, (laughs) which I do think is beautiful because it shows that Eliza (laughs) has a truly humanistic heart. She doesn't want the people that wronged her to be suffering. That doesn't help. She's trying to, like, lessen the overall amount of suffering. Right. They're like, well, does it help that I'm also suffering? She's like, no. Why would it? (laughs) Talking of just normal people when they're children, they appeared, as they had always appeared to Eliza and me, to be under some curse that required them to speak only of matters which did not interest them at all. Yeah. I feel like that everywhere except when we're recording this podcast. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And then when his uh, one of the last people left at the White House dies in his arms in the Oval Office, he says, what does it all mean? What does it all mean? Over and over as he dies. And he says, I don't know, Albert, and maybe I'm glad I don't know. And I was like, that blew my mind because I realized that's one of the messages of the book. It never occurred to me that I might not want to know what the afterlife is. Like he says, what if it's worse than this? What if it's more challenging or more tiresome or tedious? Or what the purpose of life is. Like in Sirens, it turns out. What if you don't want to know that it's just a dot? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And importantly, like the apple in breakfast and like the message of Sirens, it's what you make it. So let's not look for the real answer because it's probably disappointing. Let's find an answer that we all like that makes us all feel good and believe in it. Yeah. What's wrong with that? Uh, And then the last blurt I got on the books is the last thing Wilbur Swain ever wrote is a poem he left at the end of his journal, we learn in the epilogue, which is, and how did we then face the odds of man's rude slapstick? Yes, and God's quite at home and unafraid. Thank you. In a game, our dreams remade. Yeah. Yeah. And those are, yeah, that along with the other poem before, I think those are the two poems in the whole thing. Those are the only two poems, one at the beginning, one at the end, and they really wrap it up nicely. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He picks his spots. Yeah. I think we can go on from there to another quick segment called Vana Art. Scribble, scribble, scribble. Paint, paint, paint. Sculpt, sculpt, sculpt. sculpt, sculpt. (laughs) Make pastiche collages. (laughs) Multimedia. Remix. (laughs) Sculpture remix. This is a, a relatively new segment. We do this for the Vonnegut books with drawings in them, because uh, especially later and later in his life and career, Kurt became more and more of a visual artist. Well, there's very little. Uh, Breakfast of Champions was loaded with them. Yep. This one only has a couple. Also, the the drawing of Laurel and Hardy in mine is a Hirschfeld drawing. It's not Vonnegut, so they just took a cool caricature by Hirschfeld. But there's only a couple drawings. The main one is a Lonesome No More campaign button. 
And then also, there's also a tombstone drawing for Eliza's desired epitaph, which is just, here lies Betty Brown, which is a a very fitting expression of how she feels alone, even dead. Once she is dead, she will forever be Betty Brown in her mind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And And, uh, the Lonesome No More button is rebutted by a lonesome thank god button that looks identical from people who hate him during his campaign right the the sort of party that forms that's opposed to the middle name system lonesome thank god lonesome thank god and uh the button and ends its life by being made a presidential medal of valor for bernard o'hare yeah he just like ties a blue ribbon to it and is like this means you're a good guy right (laughs) i dub the eagle one (laughs) yeah and I also, and I think it, it is pretty effective use of minimal art in it. Like he only, yeah. by drawing the button, he can do that reversal joke and he can make it significant. Yeah. And then drawing tombstones is a surprisingly common thing throughout his oh, art. Oh yeah, really but yet again, it. and I swear, I'll always be grateful for Breakfast of Champions because the apple, the apple made this clear to me. Yeah. This is what he's talking about. He loves like a button, a badge that becomes <clears throat> a medal. Right. Tombstones. These are things that are incredibly emotionally powerful and important for what they represent, right. but it's just a piece of plastic or a rock. And yeah. that's what life is. Life is just a shitty rock, <laughs> but you can make it really cool if you want. Right. <laughs> like that's uh, I love him. Yeah. <laughs> and then even putting it in a book, it's just lines. It's not even the physical. Well, that's it's what oh, you get, you I know? read a great book that is just about how language developed and how the, a drawing of an ox's head became a symbol that represents the letter A because it got flipped. And it's like, makes you think of language in a whole different way because it really is nothing. It's gobbledy like nonsense that communicates a string of thought. You know how talking works, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> blows my mind sometimes. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Are there other drawings? No, that's it. And speaking of symbols, we can go to another segment called Recurring Characters Update. Symbols. Zildjian in the house. I just wanted to do drumming. I got that now. Symbol crash. We do this segment, I think, pretty much every book, just to track all the many Vonnegut characters who keep popping up. But in his previous novel, he said he's retiring all his characters. So this one doesn't have many. He does use Bernard O'Hare again. That's partly a real person. He had his real friend, Bernard V. O'Hare, was his friend from World War II. And then that person is featured in Slaughterhouse-Five and comes up in Timequake. The name just Bernard O'Hare is a helicopter pilot in this. And then Bernard B. O'Hare is a just jerk soldier in Mother Night. Who kicks who's the nothing shit like out of the main friend. character. Yeah. Right. And then there's also a Bernie O'Hare in a short story called A Present for Big St. Nick yeah. in Bagambo's Snuffbox. And oh, then, we all know Harry Byrne. The, uh, no, <laughs> he up. just keeps modifying yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. H. McBee, his famous private eye character. <laughs> <laughs> he built O'Hare Airport. Yeah, exactly. uh, and, then, uh, and then, as we mentioned, Norman Mushari Jr. is the son of the God bless you, Mr. Rosewater Safe character, to assume, Norman Mushari. Sure. There's, no, there's no way he's not. <laughs> and that's about it for direct ones. The only other things are, thematically, this has the whippoorwill bird. And previously, we've had bird calls be crucial as symbols and as meanings in other books. Pooty wheat is in several books. And then also. Delicious Canadian dish with gravy on fries (laughs) if you haven't had pooty wheat. With a bird in it. Oh, yeah. Well, good ones have a bird in there. Yeah. (laughs) It's French Canadian. Depends on the place. Uh, Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And then also in Breakfast of Champions, he has Elgin Washington do an impression of a nightingale, and that's the bird call there. And so bird calls are thematically kind of a recurring character to pick out, too. Yep. Yep, and it's, I hate to be a broken record, but <laughs> Pooty Wheat, Whipper Will, accomplishes the same message, doesn't matter what the language is. Yeah. And he interprets it as, whip poor Will? Why? What did he do wrong? Even though the bird doesn't mean anything by it. Right. Things have meaning or don't based on your perception only. Yeah, it's Interesting, great. yeah. <laughs> and then also, uh, Laurel and Hardy come up in this, and they will be thematically in other books they're in a painting by Rabo Karabekian and Bluebeard they come up in the inner monologue of Eugene Debs Hartkey in Hocus Pocus and then in Timequake he sees some fishermen who remind him of Laurel and Hardy nice. so he just works yeah. Laurel and Hardy into his stuff from here on yeah Why not? and uh that was literally the only thing that in the movie version which we'll talk about in a second that made me go oh that's I guess that's good, yeah. is they had Laurel and Hardy as a cameo in the background. Did you notice that? <laughs> no, I didn't catch that. There's just a wide panning shot where there's two like painters working with a ladder, and you're like, oh, that's Laurel and Hardy. 
That was the only thoughtful, interesting thing you did to tackle this book. <laughs> was it the actual guys or just people who look no, alike? No, yeah, I mean, yeah, look alike, like dressed in the Laurel and Hardy yeah. costumes, doing a thing in the background. Yeah. It, right. Well, I was at least like, oh, so you did read the book. Because you can <laughs> right. only have gotten that from reading the book. Right, right. So That's someone true. on the crew at least read it, like leafed through it. <laughs> right, at least went one page into their copy. At least right. saw it was dedicated to Laurel and Hardy, <laughs> right. yeah. And then uh, also from here, we can go to another related segment called Kurt Cameo. There he is. <gasps> Get him. Kurt, Kurt. We must capture his soul. Capture the Kurt. Capture the Kurt. C -c -c capture the Kurt. This is a book where Kurt is only directly ended in the prologue, but clearly Wilbur is his stand-in. If you've never heard the show, there's a segment where we pick out Kurt Vonnegut literally or indirectly being in the mm -hmm. book. Also, Eliza is Alice Vonnegut, and a lot of the action centers on Indianapolis, where Kurt grew up. Lake Max and Cucky, where his family had a summer home, and then Manhattan, where he was living at the time. There you go. So geography and main characters. That's our Kurt Cameron. Yeah. It's really like what he was imagining the post-apocalypse only at the places he lives. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah. Yeah. Um, Stephen King style. Yeah. <laughs> right. It would be Maine if it was, yeah. Everything only happens in Maine, yeah. yeah very, <laughs> very populous, active state. And uh, let's go straight into another segment. We're whipping through them. Nice. This is a segment called Vana What? Yeah. Vana what? <laughs> Pretty good. We got it. Well, that was right good. up. That was right we on. don't have a click track or anything. We just <laughs> yep. did it. This is the segment where we get into things that may or may not be problematic or, mm. or uh, racist or anything else in the book. Political correctness run amok. Run amok. That's what I called it. Right. Anyway, we've already alluded to the slaves, which are repeatedly described as very happy and very lucky to be slaves. Right. They sing Old Man River and talk about how much they're being <laughs> slaves. Yeah. And I'm just saying, I, I, uh, it's whatever. Not, it's probably not great, but I was weirdly yeah. not that thrown by it because it seemed like one weird special case to me. That's okay. Yeah. But slavery, no. I'm just saying any not other great. time in history where you describe a scene of someone saying, Oh, they're all singing Old Man River down there? Oh, they're very happy <laughs> slaves. I would be like, I, I, bullshit, I don't think they are. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and there was also, it doesn't seem like there's any reason there had to be slaves in the book either. That's what I'm I saying. Don't know why like, I did that. If it's a small community of people who all work on this farm that she owns, you could still call them employees. Why are they right. called slaves? It implies... Or like serfs or something. You right. never find out, but are they whipped? Are they chained up? Are they not allowed to leave if they wish? Right. These are the things that I think make the word slave ring true. Yeah, it's really so weird. So yeah. it's awful. And uh, what's awful is that she's really a good lady. <laughs> Right, it's weird. Revere yeah. is presented as a great, stable, very nice person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, her main concern in life is what will happen to all, all my poor slaves when I die. What if they're just? And free? I'm just sorry. That's a weirdly. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't say that they're black, but that's a weirdly again like echoing a terrible thing that a white savior would say. Like, well, sure, I own slaves, yeah. but you know, if I left, they'd all just wander off and die. They need me. It's like nah, bullshit again. Right. They <laughs> yeah. would go their life. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So there's also there's a lot of incest in this book. And I don't know if that's super And he necessary. smokes on an airplane. I don't know which is worse. <laughs> In the intro, he smokes on an airplane, and there's incest throughout. Sort of equivalent things there, I think. <laughs> and also, uh, I think maybe the way China is depicted is a little bit uh, is sort of exoticized. It's a little bit... Like, oh, this far away, strange yes. land where, you know. It's that thing where you're like, oh, it's not insulting because I'm saying they're geniuses and they take over the world. And it's like, yeah, but it's also like, I don't know. If I went around saying all Mongolians can fly, you'd be like, that's a bizarre belief also. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, it's the it's the thing where some people are like, when I say Asians are good at math, that's a compliment. It's right. Like, no, you're making them an other and yeah, you're, making, exactly. you're stereotyping. And, and they are good. the other. Like, they right. are a mysterious alien race in this of yeah. tiny people with magic powers. And yeah. all the representatives are very rude to you. <laughs> yeah, and, and the movie blows that out even more with well, the movie okay. they're straight up aliens the movie we will get to <laughs> yeah. and the movies i'm not gonna say the what because i want to save it for the movie but the movie fucking takes the mildly offensive anti-chinese sentiment and runs with it hard yes <laughs> yeah and then the only other what -ish thing to me was the 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 overall thing of handling mental handicap 
It's it's just a little bit strange to Which be... again the movie makes way more uncomfortable than even the book. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which is part part of why I think this would be really hard to make a movie because it's like uh, there was have you ever seen Road to Morocco? It's like a Bob Hope Bing yeah. Crosby movie. Yeah. Early in that movie there's a bit where they pretend to be mentally challenged right. as like yeah. a humorous scene to get yeah. to get through a thing and <laughs> that doesn't play now. That's not nope. a thing that yeah. is great. And so there's a long chunk of this book where people are playing mentally challenged. And right. I don't know. I just just rather not read a book if, about that. You know? Forgive my use <laughs> of the word, but I think I'm trying to say what I mean. The movie really feels like someone told Jerry Lewis, play a retarded guy. Right. That will be funny. And he's Wilbur Swain, and it's the whole movie. So it's hard to yeah. watch. <laughs> and also, the movie kind of feels like Madeline Kahn, who's Eliza, heard that direction and was like, I'm not going to go gonna that do hard. that. Right. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Eliza's like, yeah, you don't go full I am Sam for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Madeline Kahn was smarter. Yeah. More but, forward uh, thinking. But yeah, so, and I think in all of and these cases. And he has cases, all the, clo- sorry, he has the colloquialisms from the era that are just like, yeah, we were Mongolian idiots. Right. Rich people in America are as inbred as Eskimos. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. But, and also I would, I would give Kurt some credit on all of these factors, except maybe the slave one, where it's, it's more a product of his time than malice, but it's still, I don't know. It's just worth noting. Certainly yeah. the colloquialism. is, ew, I can't say that word ever, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like as inbred as Eskimos is an offensive phrase. I've never even heard, Yeah, but I'm is. sure it's a phrase he heard somewhere. Yeah. Not, really. I, I was like, doubt he invented it. Yeah. I was like, Oh, that's a thing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I all did right. not think that about Eskimos. Yeah. Uh, who I believe prefer to be called Inuits. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Yeah. I do want to say just as sort of a character, what? Sure. I don't think enough scorn is heaped upon Wilbur because he's great the whole time. Or like, I always believe he's coming from the right place. But then in retrospect, the part they glossed over really is like, if he were real, if this were real, if I knew him, like if I was 70 and I married a 23 year old and proceeded to get drug addicted for 30 years and never paid attention to my child and said, I don't love him. Yeah. That's a shitty dude. Right. So it's something uh, they gloss over the middle of his life. And at the beginning and end of his life, he's an incredibly noble person. And it's kind of weird to me how quickly they gloss over this middle period where he's objectively like a horrible dude yeah. to his family, to everyone around him. Just interesting. I don't know. It made me yeah. think of like how John Lennon says all these inspiring things, I believe. But it, when you read about <laughs> his life, you're like, oh, but he was like a dick to the people literally physically in the room with him. Right. That seems contradictory. <laughs> or even it, or even it'll be like, oh, yeah, my one true person was Yoko Ono. But also I had a quote unquote lost weekend where I was with another lady for like a year and a half. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> it's not a long you know, weekend. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Eliza says he's a swine. And I do think he's kind of a swine. That's there. Yeah, like he yeah. doesn't love his son, even though they wrote the ultimate child rearing guide. Just follow the guide, <laughs> dude. You wrote the guide. Do what it says. Yeah. And that's also, <laughs> I don't even necessarily judge that character. It just jumps out to me as another, like, it, it makes it hard for me to love the book and also extra hard to make it a great movie because yeah. like you want a protagonist who's either likable or, or interestingly evil. Siren, and he's like yeah. just kind of a, an asshole a lot. That's one of those few differences. I think Sirens would make a great movie, and I can't believe that it hasn't been a hit movie already. Yeah. I don't think anyone should have ever made this movie. And mm. the one it was made into is uh, was an unfortunate misstep. Yeah, yeah. Did you find the interview with Jerry Lewis on Carson no. being embarrassed about that movie? Let's actually why don't we why don't we get into yeah. another segment called Movie Time? Buzz. Click, 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 Buzz. click, boom! Buzz. The band saliva is coming back. Cut, get it again. <laughs> Yeah, we got to get that again. That was nothing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is a yeah, segment where we talk about the film adaptation of the book, if there is one. And uh, this one has a movie. It's a it doozy. It was uh, shot in 1982, released, I believe, in 1984. And it was called Slapstick of Another Kind. It was directed and partially written by a guy named Stephen Paul. And it stars Jerry Lewis and Madeline Kahn as Wilbur and Eliza Swain and their parents. It also has Marty Feldman as a butler named Sylvester, who is not in the book. Right. Uh, just an invented character for Marty Feldman to be. And they changed Dr. Mott's name to Dr. Frankenstein. Right. Which, if you're a fan of the podcast, you could scan as a fortitude reference. Right. But I actually think it's a Marty <laughs> Feldman reference. I think so. And, I, well, think and they Khan, wa- yeah, I think right. they just wanted... Right. <laughs> but I think they just wanted to make him Igor to a Frankenstein again. Right. It's a mess of a movie. It's really, it's, it's no only, good. <laughs> it's only like 80 minutes long. It also uh, opens with 
a shot of like space and there's a voiceover where aliens are talking about how they need to send emissaries to earth to teach earthlings how to be better so and that instead of already... psychic they are explicitly aliens from outer space on a mission to save humanity yeah and they already sent some to china which is why china is so advanced and now they're going to put two in a lady in america to help america and then we go straight to a very TV movie looking hospital where the kids are born and the whole like first 15 minutes of the movie is adults talking about how ugly two babies are. And then and from way, there, way too much of the humor is them literally looking at someone who was born with a birth defect and making jokes about how ugly they are. Yeah. That's bizarre. <laughs> and when they're not doing that, it's straight up Chinese people are weird humor. It's a lot of, I think they were trying to do something along the lines of E.T. with this, but also a broad Jerry Lewis comedy. That's what's crazy is it's like a broad, campy, racist <laughs> 50s comedy Yeah, spliced with the last third act, which again deviates entirely from the book, Right, is a pretty standard happy, like, basically the Chinese, I don't even remember, no, it's not, it's the American government military who are not represented in the book but exist, there's <laughs> right. like a cowboy hat military general in the movie yeah who captures wilbur steals him puts him in some kind of crazy electrical cage that reads his brain waves and tortures him super strong eliza breaks into the facility and saves him they live right. happily ever after being alien people that the world admires and they save human or no the yeah. aliens pick them back up and they're like humans aren't ready for you yet come live happily ever after as super smart aliens yeah and then they fly off into space and yeah. then it just sh says <laughs> hi ho nuts. on the screen and then the credits roll with an original song called putting our heads together by randy bishop which is like an upbeat hip song about the literal plot of the book. The incest <laughs> is referenced briefly yes. as in order to answer a question, they need to take off their shirts and touch their nipples. Right. The movie also That's can't, as far as it goes. can't do that full Obviously. on. Obviously. So he just said yeah. he threatens to do it once and everyone freaks out. Right. Clearly shot in Los Angeles. So yeah. many shots with palm trees, even though it's supposed to be New York and <laughs> Cape Cod. It's ridiculous. Right. And it also, and it just does that weird alien frame device instead of any of the apocalypse stuff any of the future the apocalypse is vaguely them. referenced near the end of the movie because you see someone driving a horse and buggy instead of a car that's it yeah that's yeah, the yeah, only yeah. reference to the fact that the world will end soon gas costs a thousand dollars a gallon so everyone uses chicken shit for fuel which does sound like a vonnegut thing but it's not they right. made that up. They just kind of, they just kind of invent a lot of stuff in this. There's also a brief random Kilgore Trout line that they give to a different character, and Kilgore Trout's not in this book. So yeah, it's all over. The also, place. to subdue the kids when they're freaking out, they pull out a giant can that just is all black with the word mace on it in giant letters. And when they spray them in the face with the mace, it makes them drowsy and pass out like chloroform. <laughs> like they don't <laughs> understand what mace is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, the president of the United States is played by Jim Backus, most famous as the voice of Mr. Magoo. So right. you can hear my ear caught it. I was like, is this Mr. Magoo president? Like his voice, it's the voice of Mr. Magoo and he doesn't change it. <laughs> he plays the president that you can't take seriously. When yeah. they're thinking hard, magical lights swirl around them. Right, there's a lot of swirling light. There's a lot of <laughs> scenes of them just throwing food at each other. And there's a president in the movie because I think they know Wilbur is the president in the book, but it's just a yeah. different guy who watches them throw food and like huffs about it, you know? And it's. Uh, the helicopter is turned into a car because clearly the production could not afford to shoot a scene with a helicopter. Right. I think that's about it. <laughs> it's pretty well, and, bad. <laughs> and also in his letters, Kurt at the time talks about how, oh, they're going to make a movie. And then my collection of them includes his letter to the director telling him, you are on your own with the movie. I have done all a writer is supposed to do, which is to give you a script. You can accept it or reject it or whatever. And he sounds very, it's like a very pissed off, very legal. Like you said you were going to make a movie of it. You've really screwed up the process of yeah. it. And I've done my contractual stuff. He, and he closes it with like, all future correspondence should go to my lawyer. I don't want to talk to you anymore. And I watched the behind the scenes for the film. And it was funny to watch the writer director telling the story of how the movie came together was like, well, my friend Marty, who was an executive, had a slate of properties wow. available for adaptation. And you're like, this is not, uh, this is not a labor of love. Right? Right. This, this does not come fan. from that place. Yeah. And then the last thing I want to mention is Fu Manchu, the Chinese representative, played very ably by Pat Morita, shrunk down. Good actor. To, to, yeah, good yeah. actor. But 
flies around <laughs> in a UFO shaped yeah. like a fortune cookie. Right. Yeah. Don't watch the movie. <laughs> yeah, and it, and the movie has sl- just racial slurs about Asian people that the book doesn't have. And I'll have uh, you know later in their lives, Jerry Lewis and Madeline Kahn don't want you to watch this movie. Everyone yeah. involved with the movie thought it was a bad movie. <laughs> yeah, in the next year, Kurt writes a letter to Robert Whitey where he says it's dreadful and says that he wants it to never be... My prayer is that it never be shown to anybody again in any form. Uh, That's awesome. And he blames Jerry Lewis and the producer, writer Stephen Paul for ruining it. And he he also says in his letters that Jerry Lewis's next project that he was really itching to get to go do was The King of Comedy with Martin Scorsese. Sure. So he was like, probably... So also probably Jerry Lewis was just like, let's wrap this up. I'm going to go do a Scorsese movie with De Niro. Like, let's move on. And that is the main weakness. It seems like they tried to re write it as a wacky screwball jerry lewis vehicle yeah it would be like if you cast oh jim carrey's good at dramatic acting now let's cast him into kill a mockingbird we better rewrite it to feel like a jim carrey movie no (laughs) what are you doing right like adam sandler wants to do a farewell to arms did you all right we better put it some fart jokes yeah (laughs) right and like rob schneider's the nurse all of a sudden you know (laughs) oh boy yeah um but it did get me on a slate of i found out there are a ton of classic Jerry Lewis movies available for free on YouTube. Some of them still are pretty funny. Well, that's also... So Patsy, I, Hardly Working, there's some good stuff. I also, in watching it, I think I realized I've seen no Jerry Lewis movies ever. Or I maybe had seen Hardly Working because yeah. of my dad, but yeah. So I'm not really familiar worked. with him as a talent. Like Maybe he's awesome in other movies, but he's, he's not. I went on a whole spree yesterday while prepping for this of looking at clips of his most famous bits and best bits, and I do think he is basically like a progenitor of Jim Carrey. Cool. He's like all physical. It's all about the number yeah. of facial expressions he can make <clears throat> and his annoying voice and how fucking like scrawny and mobile he is. Okay. And I am one who can sit down and like appreciate something like, oh, this is like how this is it was invented. This is a link in that chain. But I will say Jim Carrey's like better than him at everything he does. <laughs> or, you know, like yeah. people have come after who do it better. So sure. I bet a lot of people watching his old shit would be like, this doesn't hold up. This is not good. But if you can appreciate like this is the roots of this he invented this style of this thing. That's great. Then, yeah. then they're interesting to watch. Yeah. And the movie clearly, they, like, they linger on him getting knocked down or getting back up in a fun way, or like, yeah. you know, experiencing pain. And, th- and they clearly think he's very good at making this hilarious. Yes. You know. And, well, I would say yeah. I think I've laughed more at Professor Frank than the real Jerry Lewis in my life. <laughs> Professor probably. Frank's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> makes you laugh. He makes you think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you think? Is there anything you'd want to do in a meat segment? Still? I have questions. All right, let's get meat. into another segment called The Meat. I pop, got pop, 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 questions. Pop, pop, pop. Questions to do. The Navy gets the gravy, but the Army gets the beef. That's a Jerry Lewis song from <laughs> In the Army Now or some Dean Martin shit. Oh, anyway. Yeah. There's a, if you've never heard the show, The Meat is a segment where we get into any other meetings that we haven't covered yet. We still get. Yeah, and I did something I didn't do before, which was... Uh, I realized I want to ask you questions more than I have things to say. Great. Yeah. Do you think Kurt Vonnegut believes love exists? <laughs> I think at this time in his life, he was super questioning it. But I also think that he believes it can exist and believes it's worth trying to create it as much as you possibly can. Like that Sirens of Titan uh, moral toward the end of we need to love whoever's around. I think he really, truly believes that. I do too, but I wonder... It might be on a FOMA level. I wonder if he questions if we overrate love. Oh, yeah. Just like in narrative, love may be real and it may be a valuable building block of life, but like we treat it like it will solve everything and it won't. So I think he's trying to de-glamorize it. As you say that, I'm realizing this, this book, especially the prologue, might be an extension of in Breakfast of Champions when he's arguing that storytelling and narrative structure has misled everybody yeah i think here he's specifically picking out how the idea of great loves or great romances do that too like i think there's even a line oh, where yeah. eliza and wilbur are kids they're holed up in the mansion and they've read a lot of romances and they come to believe that if you fall in love with someone immediately that person will burst into your life and mess <laughs> everything up because that's what happens in love stories as we at cracked have observed if you're like reading any love story from a detached perspective, it just seems like a stalker. Yeah. So they're like, I don't want 
people outside my window with a boombox. Yeah, that's yeah. fucking creepy. Yeah. And and at least one of the characters radically remakes their life usually to make the the new love happen. Mm-hmm. You know, like there'll be so, or at least they'll block traffic on a bridge or run through an airport or like, yes. you know something drastic will, will occur. You know. I also want to ask what you thought of the Tourette's theme, because not only does he end up addicted to a Tourette's syndrome curing drug. Yeah. And by chance meet a child who has Tourette's and give his last stash to the child. In the intro, he mentions people who have Tourette's and then partway through the book in passing, he mentions the concept of Tourette's again. Tourette's comes up over and over. And yeah. I his his understanding of it, whether it's medically accurate or not, I don't know, because I know we uh pop culture understanding of mental illness is often different than what it's really like. Right. But he presents the classic understanding of it makes you shout curse words uncontrollably, which I've come to learn is not that accurate of most people who have Tourette's. But oh, okay. that's what he was thinking, and that's how he's using it. So, like, being unable to stop from spouting ugliness, is that him as a writer? Is truth oh. ugly and he can't stop spouting it? But he's addicted to feeling good at the expense of learning the truth. That's interesting. I don't know. I hadn't Do, I hadn't really remarked on the Tourette's thing as I read. I didn't fully sift through it to any meaning. Yeah. And right now I'm like putting stuff together and seeing if anything matches up. But Well also and in reading about his life, I haven't bumped into anything where it's like Tourette's loomed large with anybody right. new or anything. Uh, right, whereas like in this intro yeah. you find out his brother co founded the chapter of AA in his town. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh, that's why you love AA so much. Like in five <laughs> books, you're like, the best things in the world are fi- volunteer firefighters and AA. Right. And I actually think AA has terrible success statistics. Like it's not a very effective organization. <laughs> yeah, and Kurt's not but aware. I'm like, oh, so, but your yeah. brother founded it. So or of course his, his you uncle, love it. His uncle. Oh, sorry, Alex, your yeah. uncle, yeah. yeah. His beloved Uncle Alex, yeah. Yeah, I think the Tourette's thing, I don't I think. I think that's just like a device he found or a thing he thought worked well for the plot, honestly. Yeah, that, that didn't yeah. jump out to me that much. But that's, but that's super curious that it's in the book so much. Yeah, yeah I think there's some meat there, and I'd lo- I'll leave it to the audience to chew on it and like post on the yeah. Facebook page what I do you also, think that bit of meat was about. And I know very little about that condition, just as a person. I, I like I haven't researched it much. Or, I'd be interested if anyone yeah. out there suffers with Tourette's. Well, yeah, let yeah. us know on the page just what it's like. I already said the prologue is a full 12%, and plus the epilogue, it's a full 21%. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Thanks I just for think breaking that's that an down. In- it's an interesting yeah. choice, yeah. That's amazing. Oh, I thought it was really cool that their ancestor, Elihu Swain, died on the day of a party he was throwing in honor of Mark Twain and Edison. Yeah. So it's the combination of wry satirist and technologist, Kurt Vonnegut. Oh, yeah. Like he's throwing a party for the spirit that will become, I think, Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah, yeah. Cause, and in the prologue, he specifically picks out that Kurt and his brother both love Laurel and Hardy and also love Twain. And those yeah. are, that's their sense of humor. That might be all I have, although the one meaty thing I looked up that I thought was cool is Fu Manchu. You know pop culture history of Fu Manchu, right? Isn't it, It's like a villain in serials, There's right? a series of novel, British novels that had <clears throat> Fu Manchu, and we don't use it anymore because we don't like to just be like a <laughs> evil Asian guy who talks in a thick accent played by a white dude usually. But Fu Manchu, while being problematic, was also not wholly, like it wasn't like a race-hate character. He was a smart, capable supervillain, like Bond-style villain, and he had the classic was, mustache yeah. we call the Fu Manchu mustache. Anyway... I looked up, like, but what does it mean, though? I'm wondering why Kurt used it. And I guess Fu Manchu translates to the warlike one. And I don't know if it means anything, but I am taking it as a FOMA to mean, because I think it's cool, to be a clue that Fu Manchu probably had Eliza killed. Oh, yeah. Versus it was an accident. And or screwed up the gravity on Earth. Like, right. Like I maybe. took it as yeah. a clue to be that yes, the Chinese did the gravity thing and killed Eliza. Yeah. Interesting. Um, might not be anything. Might just be like he's like, that's a name from pop culture I heard, I'll use it, but whatever. I also don't know why in a world where Fu Manchu exists, why is this guy named Fu Manchu? Right. And no one ever says like Oh, really? Like the famous villain from that series of novels and movies? Right. (laughs) It's like if he showed up and he was like, my name is Jackie Chan. (laughs) No, that's a person. Yeah. Uh, yeah, You're like, don't name your... Right. You can't steal that from your unrelated book. My name is Richie Cunningham. (laughs) (laughs) And then I thought the other meaty thing that was so interesting to me is that Fu Manchu, when he's looking at all their papers, this is the thing I wanted to zoom in on a little bit. I thought the ideas that they come up with that we learn about are fucking awesome. Even some of the ones in passing. For example, the refutation of Darwin 
being that it seems unlikely that the mutated creatures would survive mm. long enough to bear children in the first iteration when they're mutated, obviously as an, an analog for how they feel as freaks of nature born into, and they don't think they'll survive. Oh, okay, yeah. And Vonnegut also constantly felt his brain was unique and he was going to die soon. Yeah, you're going to love Galapagos. Oh, that, great. That okay, you. great. Yeah. Well, I, oh, of course there's a, Vonne, or a Darwin connection. It's Galapagos. Yeah. I yeah, never yeah. knew that. Okay. But yeah, all that stuff. And uh, they also have the gravity work. They have the middle name thing. And when he says, sees the middle name thing, he makes it, Wilbur makes a point of like, ah, the middle name thing. I, what do you think of that? <laughs> I like that one, basically. And he says, it is truly the work of children. Uh, so like the gravity one's the interesting one to them, and they dismiss that. And I just was wondering why you think that is true if, like, I can't understand what he tried to use the Chinese people to represent, I guess. Because why are they so dismissive and cold and rude when their mastery of nature comes from the fact, it says early in the book, that they have a bunch of congenial, loving people working together with their mental powers combined in like a yeah. nice family. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't they recognize the middle name thing as a very similar to that idea? And wouldn't they be like, that's a great idea. That's kind of what we did. That did strike me a bit. I think Kurt thinks, and it's sort of an exoticized idea, but that Chinese family structure is so much stronger and so much more ingrained. And so to them, having that natural and powerful connection to each other, they see this just artificial mass-produced American assembly line version of sure. it as stupid. Yeah. And that's what I, I do get that. I guess I just think he did fall into the pit of just making the Chinese like rude or mean because they're the enemy. Right. When, like, he, I don't know. It's weird that they weren't also genial about it. I would imagine yeah. that a psychically linked, super powerful intelligence <laughs> that has no threat from you and no worry for you, but is interacting with you, would have no reason to be rude to you, right? Because yeah, yeah. they're. Their self worth has is already set compared to you. Like, right, right. They don't have to be rude or biting, but <laughs> but Fu Manchu is repeatedly like snarky. I just don't see why he would be, but whatever. Yeah, yeah, that is weird, and and I think a a, a part of the thing, I, a mistake on Kurt's part, probably. Yeah, or yeah, just a weird thing. To a do. half a half mistake. It's so weird because he's trying to do honor to something he really sees as a true strength, which is great about Chinese culture, which is the emphasis on the family unit. Yeah. But then he also falls afoul of like generalizing broadly about a whole continent of people. Yeah. I don't know how, what to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> like it's certainly not like a slam job against Chinese people, but some of the stuff makes you feel cringy. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Yeah. But again, way better than the movie. Ugh. The mo oh, Just for the record, the book does not have a fortune cookie UFO. Right. In fact, it has one of my favorite things is that he says, you Chinese people are so tiny, you always just appear. Yeah. <laughs> like you're sitting on my mantle when I come into the living room and you're like, I need to talk to you. Like, how'd you, how'd you get, get to, my mantle? to my mansion? And he goes, same way we get to Mars. That was a good That's good a great thing. line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny of them to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What, you a, got, what a yeah. great meat. That's I think, all the that, meat I that's, got. Yeah, yeah, that's about it. I think we uh, we only have a few more segments, and one of them is Kurt Vonnegut grades. Oh. Great, 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 great. Yeah. Great, 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 great. If you never heard the show, there's a book called Palm Sunday, which, uh, again, is going to be a live show of ours coming up. But Kurt looks back and grades himself relative to himself, and he gave this book, Slapstick, a D which is uh, the lowest grade Ouch. he gave anything. It's the same grade he gave Happy Birthday, Wanda June, but it's, and it's the lowest grade he gives any of his novels. Breakfast of Champions was also a D or a C? C uh, Breakfast was a C. C, yeah. Yeah, and I think I would give this about a C, it's, which is about what I gave Blair Piano. It really isn't as funny as I want it to be. It isn't as incisive as I want it to be. And also, the I felt like the plot and story really meandered. It didn't really move in the okay. way I was hoping it would. And it's a lot of things he's done before, but didn't quite strike me as hard. There's still some gems within it here and there, but not not a favorite. I'll give it a solid B. I'm always going to love all the sci-fi ones, but I really think there was more meat there than I knew. I think this is the third time I've read it in my life. And there was more insight than I remembered. Yeah. So maybe that's giving me a false positive, but I'll go B. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's more... Uh, it yields up insights the more deeply you think about it. And uh, 
And Kurt's usually not like that. He's very surface. Not in a bad way. Right. That's his whole like flipping He's of the paradigm direct. is, I'm not going to fucking hide the moral from you. Here's the moral. It's the first sentence of the book. And uh, this one does that less. It's more traditional in hiding some of the surprises for the end and stuff like that. And there's something about that I like. It's neat to read Kurt writing in a slightly different style. It yeah. feels different than the other ones. For sure. I, I get that. Mainly yeah, in, I, the I plotting, the... in the plotting itself, yeah. Yeah, it, it feels... Like you said, restraint, and I, I think yeah. I, I think I miss Wild Kurt, but I understand the value of the restraints yeah. and the the different approach. The Kurt voice, re-invent. the Kurt voice that is the essayist or stand up comedian who can break in at any time with commentary is almost completely absent. He yeah. does not. He holds his peace. Yeah. And I miss it. <laughs> yeah. I miss it. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I'm wondering if that's as we go on, if that's going to be a recurring theme of the second half of his canon versus the first half. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, that's interesting. Because also, uh, they're, the few I haven't read are more toward this. Later I would agree. Uh, I think one of the only ones I remember vividly from the future now is Dead Eye Dick. And I would also call that one fairly restrained and plot-focused more than huh. more than Breakfast, more than Slaughterhouse, definitely. Yeah. Hmm. It's going to be a great show. Keep that in your noggins. And speaking of other books, here comes a segment called Related Reading. Go on the prepared at all. Uh, I only brought movies. Oh, no. <laughs> Is that true? I have two books. That's it. I have two short stories and a song. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Very uh, light homework this time. <laughs> I'm very disappointed with the number of people who are actually sending me completed book reports, so I decided to shorten <laughs> up my... Yeah. yeah. Well, if, if you've never heard the show, this is where we pick you up just book reports. <laughs> other readings and uh, send us some work. No, just other readings and other works that remind us of the book. And we think maybe you'll dig them too. One of mine is uh, I would pick out a book called More Than Human, and it's by Theodore Sturgeon. And uh, it's partly a recommendation because Theodore Sturgeon is, other than Kurt, the main basis of Kilgore Trout. So I almost recommend it in one of the Trout books. Yeah. But More Than Human is about a group of six people who become one gestalt i think it is like one super organism gestalt. when they gestalt they become one more powerful being when yeah. they combine and meld their souls and minds and so it's an overall adventure and process of trying to find each other and trying to stay together it's very directly related to the wilbur and eliza connection in this and, and the voltron cartoon actually. right and, <laughs> and power rangers yeah and but and and it's an excellent piece of writing, and it's one of the landmarks of Sturgeon's work. So both for the slapstick connection, and if you want to just know what he's like, uh, it's a good a good piece. Yeah, yeah. I just realized how much though it would suck to be best known for someone else's fictional characterization of you. Yeah, that's like tough. Theodore Sturgeon is still most famous because his name became Kill yeah. Trout. I'd be like if I. I could somehow check in on my work a hundred years from now. And they're like, oh, everyone loves that character Brett Rader invented, Mickey Swim Swam. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I was a real man. <laughs> I mean, the Mickey Swim Swam novels are excellent. Are, yeah, they're th- gripping, really. <laughs> Life-changing. My Harlan Ellison short stories back in the mix. I'm going to oh, yeah. recommend a Harlan Ellison short story also about interdependence and codependence called In Fear of K, the oh. letter K. Cool. And uh, it's about these two people who, a man and a woman who are in a tube and they don't remember why, <laughs> but they know there's a monster outside, even though all the doors are open and food comes out of holes every so often. And you then you figure out why, you know, obviously, oh, cool. like right, a sci-fi a story, something. Yeah. something changes the equation and the truth of it is revealed what's going on. Cool. But I'll just say the themes are identical. How cool. where lonesomeness is the worst human condition. You need other people to not only to exist, but your ideas bouncing off of other people's ideas is the only thing that makes progress and amazing ideas happen usually. And yet... Being dependent on other people is its own kind of pain and blah, 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 blah. Codependence, interdependence, all the brother-sister shit. Wow. Yeah, it's a good cool. one. Yeah. My other one is a Ray Bradbury thing. Nice. And it all is, right, we're back uh, to our roots. Yeah, back to what we do. And uh, this is a book called Something Wicked This Way Comes, which mm. is uh, one of his biggest works. And it jumped out to me for this one because the two main characters are very, very good friends named Will and Jim. And the way they match and don't match and the way they try to stick together through 
a dark force uh, enveloping their American town. There were echoes of slapstick in it to me, and I'll, and but also it works much much better for me in about ah, every way. It's right. uh, it's great, nice. just a fantastic book. And also, and a lot of Bradbury's quote unquote novels are short stories stitched together very artfully. Yeah. But something wicked this way comes as a straightforward novel. It's all one piece, and it's a, a really really. Good work. It's, it's also it's also the kind of horror I like, where it's it's a uh, haunted carnival, accessible. right? Yeah, a haunted carnival comes into their town, I, which is yeah, like you've yeah. seen before. But this is arguably the original, yeah, epic horror story about a haunted carnival arriving in town and the town turns evil. Yeah, like yeah you've yeah. seen that since then, but that was one of the first ones I think I can think of. Yeah, and it's also about it's a town in scary. Illinois. So I'm from there Illinois. Oh, and it works for me. Go. I'm glad we're going creepy. My next one's H.P. Lovecraft. Oh, yeah. Uh, the wow. story is called The Outsider. And this is so weird. I didn't do this on purpose, but I'm just realizing. It's about a guy who is born, who has always lived in a cube. <laughs> and he knows he's not supposed to leave even though the doors are open. It's just people in containers. It's true. I love stories <laughs> that start with people in containers. I mean, five characters yeah. in search of an exit, anything. Oh, sure, I yeah. love as long as there's an answer. As long as the end is a twist that says, right. here's what the container. That's why cube sucks. <laughs> so at the end, they're like, I don't know. Did, you liked it though, right? Mm. You liked the cube. Cubes, yeah. right? So no, of course, this one has a uh, an ending that explains. <laughs> Basically, he lives. He's this grotesque monster that lives in a castle all alone, and he finally decides to leave his castle and go into the outside world and see how people react. He knows he's hideous looking, but he wants to see what happens. And uh, you see the connection, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, hideousness, being raised in a castle, not knowing what the outside world is like, and then going out into the outside world and being like, oh, this is how people react to monstrousness, grotesqueness, stupidity, and intelligence. A lot of similar themes. Yeah. Right, right. That's great. It's a good one. Well, yeah, I, I don't know it, but it sounds great. Widely considered one of Lovecraft's better stories, I think, because it's one of the only ones with a message that's like, oh, emotions or human, the human condition. Because, you know, 90% right. of the time, he's just like an action movie. Like, you read it because you're like, that thing with tentacles was cool, and then they killed it by ramming a boat into it. That was <laughs> rad. But it's one of his only ones that ruminates on, like, what's the meaning of life? Yeah, yeah, cool. Which he rarely does. <laughs> That's good because I I haven't read very much of him at all. But yeah, my understanding is it's mostly old gods coming out of the sea. And well, he always says, "What's the meaning of life?" <laughs> but the answer is always just an ancient monster faced squid man is right. gonna kill you, <laughs> and you either go crazy or die or kill it back. Right. Like he's straightforward action stories. <laughs> like you know, yeah. You don't read it and try to figure out. But what does Stephen King think about love between? humans right it's like no it's just no the clown the was rad yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and he had a song i'm out of related reasons oh yeah i have a song and uh i've noticed every time i say i'll ask brett to include a clip he does so i'll ask brett to include a clip ha it's just like saying i love you <laughs> it's like putting a gun to your head gun you have to, to do it yeah a great Frank Zappa song. So there's a double connection. Oh, yeah. There's a double connection. Uh, Vera Chipmunk 5 Zappa is His a daughter, character. Right. This is a Zappa song called Bobby Brown Goes Down. Whoa. One of my favorite Zappa songs. Very, I still don't know much, uh, Zappa. much like this book, incredibly filthy song about a young man named Bobby Brown who got his balls ripped off once, but. His dick still works, but it shoots too quick, I think is the chorus. She had my balls in a vice, but you left the dick. I guess it's still hooked on, but now it shoots too quick. Oh God, I am the American dream. Bizarre song about the life of a Zappa-created character named Bobby Brown. Real catchy. If you like Zappa music, you'll like it. And I was just like... <coughs> How can I not mention it? It's called Bobby Brown by Zappa. It's right. insane. And it's crazy. And it's, yeah. And equally about a guy whose life goes off the rails because his sexuality is way too overt for everyone. So yep. it almost made me wonder if he read Slapstick or even was in passing about Slapstick. Yeah. But uh, I don't think it is. It seems like, I wonder if the timeline even works out. It probably does. Well, by the end, he's like getting a golden shower from his co-host at the radio DJ place where he works. So I'm like, I, the connections fall apart. I don't see that really connected to slapstick, but if I'm, if I'm Googling, right, it's a song from 1979 and this book is from 1976. 
Really interesting. Yeah. Maybe it even makes me wonder if the phrase caught in his head. Like, even if he didn't write it to be about slapstick. Or, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Bobby Brown Super goes cool. down. <laughs> yeah. By Frank Chipmunk 5 Zappa. That's right. Uh, <laughs> well, that's great. And let's go to a next segment called Vonnegut News. <laughs> oh, the news <laughs> is depressing <laughs> <laughs> it is not but because, not Vonnegut news no it's fantastic <laughs> uh we had the uh real treat of getting to see a play in town it's a, a dramatic version of the sirens of titan Fabulous. performed by sacred fools theater company in uh, hollywood and uh it was excellent they did a really loved uh, it they, it was yeah. a adaptation by Stuart gordon and uh, he worked directly with Kurt Vonnegut back in the 70s, I believe, to write the adaptation of it. Famed then, for writing and directing Reanimator, the cult classic yeah. horror movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, director Ben Rock at Sacred Fools uh, worked with Gordon and found the adaptation because they'd even lost track of the script. Yep. Uh, and then they put it up, and I, it was a really... We were wondering amongst ourselves how easy it would be to track if someone had never read the book, and I don't really know. But having read the book, it was an excellent dramatic presentation of it. Yeah, excellent adaptation. My only thought was, I wonder if it would be confusing if you never read the book, just because some of the stuff is so wacky. Yeah, right. And right. It's a hard like, book to, without a narrator, a hard I book to digest. I can't believe they had the balls to keep Salo as described in the book. Yeah. Didn't, didn't you think Salo would be like a green dude with an antenna? Yeah, it was amazing. They put together a whole sort of rig, puppeted rig and yeah. costume for it, and it collapsed when it needed to, and it got put back together when it needed to. But I am wondering if you were had never read the book, and you see that character, and he comes out as like a sphere with three legs, and it's played by an actor who's puppeteering it from inside on a little stool. Yeah. If you hadn't read the book, you'd be like, why'd they make that that? Why does that look like that? That looks so right. hard to do as the actor. Yeah. It's like, well, they wanted it to look like it's described in the book and it is literally described as not human shaped. Like it can't, right. you can't make it a costume. It has to be a rig. Yeah, yeah. So Salo was very impressive. Kazak is also a dude in a full dog costume. Just full dog costume. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they also, their production, they, uh, they said uh, in another podcast and also to us that they were partly inspired by World War II being a big influence and theme in it, which is something I hadn't really thought about so much no, with Sirens. Either. But they, in doing that, made Winston a lot like FDR, and they tried to give uh, Beatrice sort of a Eleanor Roosevelt vibe yeah. and uh, and played up the overall sort of war between worlds as a as a noble yet still screwed up conflict. Yeah. And the way that there were multimedia elements to it and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of great costume switches and they did the act break right when they're stuck on Mercury and it, it was just I, I pretty much every choice they made worked for yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. So big thanks to Ben and Alicia the dramaturg who made us feel yeah. very welcome. Yeah, they did. Great show. And it was an excellent show, yeah. yeah. So check out Sacred Fools Theater. Company. I mean I always want to support good stuff. I always want to support all theatrical efforts. So I don't mean yeah. it as a slam on the other one, but I will say, by way of complimenting this production, yeah. head and shoulders above the other Kurt play we saw as part of this podcast. Yeah, and I think partly because they chose material that we're both. Just I guess uh, maybe more maybe into. that's it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was great, and there it was. Uh, it's the twentieth anniversary of their theater company, so they're Sacred been around Fools. a while and, yep. and check them out. They've done a lot of good work over the years. Um, and then also, if you're in Indianapolis, uh, the Kurt Vonnegut Memorial Library is doing a art show. Uh, they're showing off a bunch of original prints based on Vonnegut's work. It's uh, the the name of the show is Satine Dura Lux, which is a kind of paint that Rabel Karabekin uses in Bluebeard. But that's on display from May 31st to June 28th at the Museum in Indianapolis. So check it out. I will. Yeah. That's uh, a lie. It's art by 20 <laughs> printmakers inspired by Vonnegut. And then also, if you want to see a production of Mother Night, that's happening in May and June in San Francisco with the Custom Made Theater Company. That also opens uh, May 25th and then closes June 24th. And then the big, big Vonnegut news, we're doing a live episode so Woo! soon. So, so quick. Soon. It's going to be May 31st, 7.30 p.m. at the last bookstore in downtown L.A. We're talking all about Palm Sunday. It's a free show, and we'd love to have you there and hang out. Be there. We're going to probably take questions from the audience and get to know yeah, you. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Free show. Tipping is highly encouraged, but uh, free otherwise. Uh, are we? Well, we'll have we'll at least have an open guitar case in front of the desk, right? The, we, we did not Good plan Good people want to toss stuff in? Yeah. <laughs> 
doesn't have to be money. I'll keep anything you throw in my guitar case. That's long been is my this, rule. Is this the episode where I find out that you want a lot of guitar to be worked into the show? Like you're going to be doing I, a lot of musical well, interludes and a lot of... I just keep hoping someone will just toss a really sick electric guitar in the case. <laughs> right, I, right, I'm yeah. like, I want a free... It's That's like the, the secret. Yeah. Right. You create an empty <laughs> box in the shape of the thing you want. Yeah. And the world will fill it. Right. That's why I have a empty box at home shaped like my dad respecting me. <laughs> the world will make it. That's the Vonnegut news. <laughs> Michael, come back. Step, step, step. Yeah, door slam. Yeah. Uh, Michael, stop just saying door slam. <laughs> Yeah, so please come hang out with us, and also please uh, be excited about our next couple episodes. That live episode about Palm Sunday, we are going to put that out a little bit down the line. Our next audio episode is going to be about Jailbird, novel Kurt wrote in 1979, and then in 81, Palm Sunday came along, so that'll be the one after that, you know, electronically. If you want to see it sooner, come to the mm-hmm. live show. Yeah. You'll be way ahead of all, all our other Vana friends. And then Jailbird is actually one of the few holes I have. I haven't read that one. Me neither. Uh, it's supposed to be a very Nixon-driven novel. All right. Uh, and and if that is a theme that seems interesting to you, especially in these times, maybe that's a, of interest. Yeah. Yep. What, a deluded narcissist? A president <laughs> who hates the American people? Yeah. So yeah, so that's what's coming up. And uh, thank you again. Please uh, keep on reaching out to us on the social medias. Uh, it's at Kurt Vonna guys on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Yes. And, uh, and thank you for being our Vonna friends and thank for you, listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If this isn't nice. What is? Yeah. <gasps> <laughs> 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 Fellas, you gotta leave. <laughs> <laughs>